Yeah, I started that. Yes. Abhilash, are you saying something? No, no. I don't know why it is. OK, OK. So maybe I was on mute. OK, so at 9.30, we'll start introducing Dr. Ibrahim, and then uh, we can start with their please presentation. Uh, we also have to show our video, no, Rashmi? Yeah. Uh -huh, yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. That is in the queue. So can I just ask you how much time do I have to speak? Sorry, sir. How much time do I have to speak? OK, that is 40 minutes, uh, 9.30 to uh, 10.05, 10, 10, 10, 15. Sorry, 10, 10, 40 minutes, 9.30 to 10, 10. But I suppose you all will also take some time, no? to introduce etc and other things that you are saying yeah so look, approximately 40 minutes uh, is uh, the time okay so yeah. maybe i should try for to each talk in this session 35 yes. minutes okay yeah obviously yeah. and is and there the a will show some uh, videos and also that will take five to six minutes so around 9 35 your talk will be started so is there uh, is there a q a session yeah Okay, so how that, that Q&A is within this 40 minutes? Yes, 30 minute talk, uh, which will be followed by 10 minute or 5 minute question answer round. Right, so I need to speak for 30 minutes. Okay, fine, ah, thank you. Yeah. Professor Shivli is also joining us. She is chairing this session. So Abhilash, uh, I think we should start. Yes, right? yes. Start. So my screen is visible. Yes. Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the RB Memorial Conference on Translational Research in Medicine, TRIM 2022. Welcome to track five, digital health. Digital health is a multidisciplinary concept which aims to provide improved and cost-effective medical services through the intersection of medical technology and healthcare. It applies digital transformation to the healthcare field incorporating engineering and technology, management and services. This track is going to feature three eminent speakers, Dr. Sudeep Gupta, Mr. Girish Raghavan, and Dr. C.S. Pramesh. Let me thank all the speakers for accepting our invitation and to grace this occasion. Let me now request Mr. Ganesh Ramakrishnan, Professor in Charge of KCDH IIT Bombay, to convene this session. Good luck everyone for track five, digital health. Improving healthcare is a key priority for all countries in the world, including in digital health has proven to be a very effective tool in improving quality, access, and cost of healthcare. Consequently, digital health is one of the fastest growth areas in technology. India too is investing heavily in digital health technology. The government is rolling out the Ayushman Bharat digital mission across India, which will drive new healthcare solutions, similar to the impact of Aadhaar and UPI on financial solutions. Digital health it has substantial benefits for healthcare and its stakeholders, patients, hospitals, government organizations, doctors. We are really excited to support IIT Bombay in setting up the Center for Digital Health. Koita Center for Digital Health, or KCDH, drives research, entrepreneurship, and employment in digital health. The center is the first of its kind in India, and our vision is to establish KCDH as a globally renowned center in digital health and digital health informatics. KCDH is proud to have a world-class advisory board with renowned members from diverse backgrounds, including directors of renowned hospitals, professors from top universities, and a senior executive of leading health tech firms. We offer world-class academic programs in healthcare informatics, and we groom an exceptional cadre of students. Our students work on exceptionally good projects through internships and placements at some of the best companies in digital health. The center offers a wide range of courses in computer science, AI and machine learning, medical imaging, healthcare data management, healthcare economics, and healthcare ethics. These uh, courses are taught not just by IIT faculty, but by faculty visiting from various leading hospitals and research institutes. Partnering with expert clinical professionals, that's our key priority area. The center is actively involved in applied research development activities and facilitates collaborations between engineers, clinicians to solve real world healthcare challenges with access to clinical data and expertise. We are establishing collaborations with leading hospitals, healthcare organizations, and healthcare regulators to drive collaborations in research and teaching programs, funding, and policy. The center is committed to providing meaningful internship and career opportunities for our students. Digital healthcare is poised for a massive transformation in India. We are excited that the center can contribute to accelerating digital health adoption in India, which in turn will positively impact healthcare outcomes. We invite you all to join us and be part of our center. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Professor Sudeep Gupta from ACTREC, Mumbai. Dr. Sudeep Gupta is a professor in medical oncology at Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, India. Dr. Gupta obtained his MBBS degree from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, in the year 1992. Thereafter, he completed his postgraduate degree in internal medicine in 1994. Following his medical oncology training in the year 2000, Dr. Gupta joined Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai as an assistant professor in medical oncology and was promoted to associate professor in 2003 and professor in 2010. Dr. Gupta has been the primary author and collaborator of over 60 peer-reviewed publications in national and international journals. Currently, he is the Editor-in-Chief of Indian Journal of Medical and Pediatric Oncology and the General Secretary of Women's Cancer, Cancer Initiative. He has been an invited speaker and expert panelist on cancer at many international, regional and national congresses. Please welcome Professor Sudeem Gupta from ACTREC, Mumbai. Morning. No, Can I, I request to Professor Shivli to proceed this session. Thank you. Over to you. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Shivli Mukhopadhyay from Department of Mathematics at IIT Bombay. I will be chairing this morning session. In you are not audible. I am not audible. Just a minute. Let me get the. Oh, uh, uh, she's audible. I can hear her. She's audible. audible. Yeah, I can also. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK, so, uh, so I'll be chairing this morning session in track five, Digital Health. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Sudeep Gupta for his talk. Uh, so Dr. Gupta, you have 30 minutes for your talk, and then we'll follow it up with five to 10 minutes of questions. And so over to Dr. Gupta. Thank you. So good morning, colleagues, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to the session today. Let me share my screen and then, okay. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conference in the memory of an outstanding scientist. So, therefore, it is with a tinge of some sadness that I deliver this talk, but she continues to inspire us. And I would also like to thank the Koita Center for Digital Health and IIT Bombay for, uh, for the opportunity. I must add that I'm no longer the editor-in-chief of the journal that was mentioned in my introduction. That was several years ago. And a few other things have changed since then, but here I am. So what I will do is in the next 30 minutes, I will share uh, a few ideas related to digital health that have been incubated by my colleagues at Tata Memorial Center and ACTREC. Uh, a disclaimer is in order. I am no expert on digital health. I am a physician. I specialize in the treatment of breast and gynecological cancers. Uh, I also do a, do a bit of translational research. And so most of the ideas that I will present today are uh, have been led by uh, several of my colleagues from my institution. So this is uh, this is a, a a cartoon that depicts the growth of the world's population, and although it is hard to believe, but the population of the world until the year 1900 was only about one billion, and it has increased almost eightfold in the past hundred years. The reason and, and, and most of this increase has been in the in the developing countries and the reason why this is important is because uh, uh, individuals aged older than 65 years or, or the older population has also significantly increased in the past many decades and uh, mostly confined to the less developed parts of the world. The reason this is important is because uh, many non-communicable diseases, including cancer, are uh, diseases of aging. And what this means is that we are bound to see 
uh, a higher incidence as well as burden of diseases like cardiovascular cancer and other non communicable diseases uh, this is uh, the mortality and incidence uh, of cancer uh, as of 2020 in europe and you can see that the overall incidence was about 320 to 360 per 100000 population this is the number of new cases and the mortality was about one fourth to one third of the incidence in countries like india the incidence is much lower you can see that it is about 100 to 150 but the mortality as a proportion of of our incidence is much higher about 50 to 60 percent and this of course uh, is a reflection of the state of healthcare in many countries uh, like india um, and, and 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 we do have a long way before we can achieve the the, the kind of mortality and cures that are uh, prevalent in other parts of the world. So this is the burden of cancers. You can see that currently in India, we have about 1.3 million new cases of cancer every year. This is projected to increase to about 2.1 million in the next 20 years. In terms of deaths, 850,000 deaths uh, annually due to cancer at present projected to increase to about 1.4 million uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, this is a map of the world by the number of radiotherapy machines per million population and you can see that uh, parts of the world including India that have the highest incidence of uh, locally advanced cancers which require radiation have uh, some of the least developed infrastructure with respect to not only radiotherapy, but other treatments as well. Of course, we are getting better in the last few years and hopefully the situation will improve in the in the in the coming few decades. Uh, in terms of uh, the human resource that is available, also we are quite deficient. Uh, and I say all of this as a prelude to a talk on digital health is because of few uh, activities and initiatives in digital health can actually mitigate the deficiencies both in infrastructure as well as in human resource. On the plus side, uh, because of the robust generic pharmaceutical industry, the cost of medications including cancer medications is some of the lowest in the world in India and which is why we are also called the pharmacy of the world. So, and until about a couple of decades ago, this used to be only Tata Memorial Hospital in Paril. In Navi, Mumbai, we have Varanasi, uh, we have Guwahati, we have uh, Mullapur and Sangroor in Punjab, Muzaffarpur and Bihar. We are at and, and Vishakhapatnam, so we are at several locations all over India. The mission of our institution is to provide comprehensive cancer care to everyone with regardless of their ability to pay for it through excellence in service research and education. Um, in terms of the number of new cancer cases that we register, we would be the lar among the largest cancer institutions in the world, if not the largest. And you can see that most of the patients uh, come from within Maharashtra and from north and northeast parts of India, again pointing to some of the inequities in healthcare that are prevalent in our country in terms of uh, the geographic spread. Uh, at Tata Memorial Center, we have pioneered, at least in India, the concept of disease management groups. So individuals from several specialities, such as surgery, uh, medical oncology, radiation, pathology, radiology, etc. They come together to form a group of multidisciplinary individuals who deliver care to patients in a in a coordinated manner. So, for example, although I am a medical oncologist, my primary identity is as a physician who specializes in the treatment of only breast and gynecological cancers. And this has enabled our institution to achieve higher levels of expertise and excellence in each of these areas. Uh, we have uh, what we call the hospital information system. And this has several modules that are listed here on the left. 
and uh, we have been more or less paperless in our clinical operations for the past several years and many of you will uh, will immediately realize that this lends itself some ideas in digital health image management system we have had essentially filmless operations uh, for the past 15 years uh, all the radiology and nuclear medicine images are available online uh, with a few other uh, medical images available as well and again this lends itself uh, to some ideas in digital health so let me give you a flavor of the clinical research that we do at TMC and I will not take you through the entire gamut but point out the few uh, ideas that have lent themselves to some uh, to, to some innovation utilizing the concepts of digital health. So we have a robust clinical research system. Uh, we have three ethics committees at Mumbai and at least one ethics committees for each of our other hospitals. We have the research secretariat, clinical trial center, data monitoring committees. Uh, everything is overseen by what we call the TMC Research Administration Council. Um, let me give you a few examples of, uh, of, of the kind of research that we do. So, uh, you know that cervix cancer is one of the most common cancers uh, in women in India, the second commonest after breast cancer. Uh, a long standing question in this disease has been the relative uh, value of radiotherapy versus surgery uh, in the treatment of patients with locally advanced cancer. So should you treat patients with chemotherapy and surgery or chemotherapy and radiotherapy? And uh, we conducted a randomized control trial comparing these two, two strategies, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery versus chemo radiation. And I had the privilege of presenting this at the plenary session of the ESMO uh, Congress in 2017, subsequently published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And our group showed that uh, radiotherapy with chemotherapy resulted in uh, measurably and clinically significant improvement in disease-free survival by almost seven percentage points. But the thing was that although it resulted in a higher cure rate, the toxicity to the organs that surround the cervix, the rectum, the bladder, uh, vagina in terms of sexual health, in all of those uh, toxicities in the medium and long term, radiotherapy had a uh, resulted in a higher level of toxicities compared with surgery. So it was led by my colleague Dr. Supriya Chopra and several colleagues from the Gyne DMG group and this compared intensity modulated radiotherapy image guided which is a form of uh, very focused kind of radiotherapy very expensive but nevertheless uh, uh, a good way to deliver radiation and the idea that we tested was whether this resulted in a lower incidence of toxicity to the surrounding organs mainly the GI tract and actually uh, this was presented only a couple of years ago and then published last year in JCO and we showed that uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy did result in a reduction in uh, GI toxicity compared with conventional radiotherapy. Um, now, the point is that although it, it did result in lower grades of toxicity, as you can see here, it requires significant amount of uh, physicist and physician time. Here it is four hours compared with uh, the conventional radiotherapy that requires only about 30 to 45 minutes for planning. And the same is true for brachytherapy, which is a form of intracavitary radiotherapy for cervix cancer. Again, requires almost two hours of planning for a single patient compared with much lesser times with conventional techniques. So our uh, uh, Kinect group led by Dr. Supriya Chopra and Dr. Uh, Jamema Swamidas, who's from the medical physics department, they tried to see whether automated high precision planning could be undertaken in order to reduce uh, uh, the time that is required by physicians and physicists for planning of each treatment. And uh, so they published this paper on knowledge based planning in 2019. What they did was to uh, feed uh, 
prior treatment plans called training plans for hundreds of patients into the system and information on uh, many variables such as a structure set, dose, field geometry, etc. were extracted and then fed into the model and using a combination of principal component analysis and regression techniques, they created what is called a dose volume histogram model which then predicts the the amount of dose that each organ will receive for any particular patient based on the variables that are fed into the based on the patient variables that are fed into this automated plan this was the paper that I which was published the automated plan was uh, at least equal to and in some instances for some organs significantly better in terms of dose to the surrounding organs compared with the human plan and this was the internal validation of this automated system. This was then uh, externally validated in collaboration with Danish and Canadian colleagues. And you can see that in every single instance, the machine generated plans were better than the human plans in terms of dose to the surrounding organs. And uh, you can also, you will also note here that the total amount of planning time for the automated plan is only about 45 minutes compared with almost four hours of of uh, of physicist and physician time that is required for human planning so this particular plan was uh, was uh, was configured on a variant uh, uh, platform and this will now be available worldwide to all physicians as a choice for planning their patients when they are treating cervix cancer, including the regional lymph nodes. Uh, the same automation is also being undertaken for brachytherapy planning. Uh, this is a project that is funded by the DST. In collaboration with our colleagues from, uh, from Europe, you can see that uh, automated brachytherapy planning is also being undertaken and the actual time is almost one hour for humans versus only about one minute for the automated plan. Not only be relevant to cervix cancer but to several other cancers that require radiotherapy to the pelvis and I show you the results of a very important uh, trial that was just published by my colleague Vedang Murthy and colleagues from the Genito Urinary Group, which showed that whole pelvis radiotherapy resulted in much higher cure rates in patients with prostate cancer. So let me come to breast cancer. Uh, treatments may be effective, but they are useless unless the patients have access to those treatments. And this was in the year 2005. Hortobaji, writing in the New England Journal of Medicine, show, uh, uh, said that one year of a drug called trastuzumab, which is a HER2 targeted therapy, is revolutionary. And we audited our patients in 2008, and we found that only about 8.5% of our patients had access to this drug because of cost, uh, the cost of treatment being close to 1.2 lakhs of rupees every three weeks for almost a year. Uh, we did a few in uh, eight years, the access improved to close to 60% and it is close to about 95 to 100% now. And what did we do? We did a number of things, including social partnerships, philanthropic support, lower cost biosimilars, etc. But one thing that we consistently advocated based on the results of earlier, only a few studies was to use shorter durations of adjuvant uh, treatment with trastuzumab compared to its full one year course. But the question that uh, that has uh, a very important question that has not that had not been answered definitively was whether shorter durations of trastuzumab can lead to uh, an acceptable outcome and equivalent outcomes compared to its one year use. There are six randomized trials that have compared shorter durations ranging from three months to six months compared with one year but only one of them has reported non-inferiority. So what did we do? Pioneered a conducting an individual patient data meta-analysis. The usual way of doing it is to write to all the principal investigators, get all their Excel sheets and data, and then combine the data. What we did was to extract individual time events from the published survival curves 
using a software called the web plot digitizer and then we used uh, stata uh, ipdfc command to actually construct the ipd meta analysis literally an ipd meta analysis only from data that was extracted from published survival curves and i show you this slide only to only to uh, give you a sense of the exquisite accuracy with which we were able to reconstruct the survival curves the right the curve on the right is a reconstructed curve that we that we constructed by uh, by extracting individual uh, time events from the published curves all the data and we showed that uh, uh, three to six months of trastuzumab is actually non-inferior to its one year use. Now, three to six months is about one fourth as expensive as its one year use. And this result has been, uh, it has been adopted by the Ayushman Bharat and we have contributed to the, to a cost effective treatment that is applicable to more than half the world and extends the benefit of this treatment to many, many more patients. Uh, this is a study that was led by my colleague Shalaka Joshi. Uh, this is an online self-administered decision aid to reduce the decisional conflict in women undergoing surgery for breast cancer. So many of you know that when a woman presents with breast cancer, there are two choices for surgery. One is conserving the breast, the other one is mastectomy. And there are some trade-offs, the main trade-offs being that breast conservation leads to a better cosmesis and uh, other aspects such as self-esteem, uh, uh, psychological functioning, etc. and so on. But the, uh, but the flip side is that every woman with breast conservation does require mandatory post-operative radiotherapy. So this is a this is a difficult decision and it is difficult to convey all the nuances of the pros and cons to every single patient in the clinic. Uh, so what was done in this particular uh, study was to use an online aid and this was done in collaboration with some colleagues from the Harvard. You can see that this is the decision aid conveying various aspects of the two surgical treatment. Uh, the pro and then the patients are administered a questionnaire to measure their decisional conflict regarding mastectomy versus breast conservation. And this is the, this is the questionnaire that is used to measure the decisional conflict. Uh, so the hypothesis was that administration of a structured online decision aid will reduce the decisional conflict regarding the use of mastectomy versus breast conservation. The patients were randomized to three arms. The first arm, they uh, underwent usual care, no decision aid. In the second uh, uh, group, only the woman under, uh, was shown the decisional aid. And in the third one, it was the woman along with a key male partner who were, who were administered the decision aid. And you can see that the decisional conflict was significantly groups. Uh, which were administered the online decision aid, which is called the Navya PPT. Uh, this study was has been presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium as well as ASCO and is currently under publication. And it is uh, ideally suited to many countries and practices like uh, India. And uh, it can be delivered in vernacular languages and can significantly uh, impact the decision making ability of our patients. Uh, this is a recent uh, viewpoint that I took from the Lancet Digital Health Data Poverty and I will quote, we assert that health data poverty is a threat to global health which could prevent the benefits of data driven health technologies from being more widely realized and might even lead to them causing harm. We argue that the time to act is now to avoid creating a digital health divide that exacerbates existing health inequalities and to ensure that no one is left behind in the digital era. So our own contribution towards reducing data poverty uh, uh, in terms of the cancer scenario in India is this particular project that has been funded by the Department of Biotechnology. This is in collaboration between TMC, IIT Bombay, and I saw Dr. Amit Sethi, he's our main collaborator from IIT Bombay, AIMS, 
PGI and Rajiv Gandhi Hospital in Delhi. And the is to build a database of cancer radiology and pathology images linked to their clinical information and to annotate the images and make the annotations available as part of the database. And subsequently, this will be available to everyone to drive AI based algorithm development using the biobank infrastructure. You can see that this will be both pathology and radiology images with uh, with the, with relatively granular level clinical information. Uh, a minimum data set has been defined. And uh, many of you know that cancer is a longitudinal disease. It's not a cross sectional disease and therefore it is very important to also uh, collect longitudinal information and store it as part of this imaging biobank, which we are doing. Uh, in two cancers, head and neck and lung, significant progress has been made, but we are we have been approved for banking the images and linked information of almost 50,000 patients by our ethics committee, which is in progress at the current time. The viewers and annotation platforms have been finalized and deployed. Uh, there is a detailed uh, multi-level annotation, including uh, cross-checking by at least two pathologists and radiologists in each case. And this is the kind of annotation that will be available. So I'm showing you this because this data bank will take some doing to build. It is being built even as we speak now, and hopefully this will be a resource for everyone to utilize in the future. Uh, this uh, study has been shared very kindly by my colleague Dr. Swapnil Rane. We know that pathology reports are the single most important input in cancer treatment, but they have traditionally been either handwritten or typewritten or typed as a narrative report, which is nice and intuitive, but uh, also doesn't lend itself to archival, retrieval, and digital health uh, activities as much as a synoptic kind of reports that we used to give out and not until until not very recently. Uh, so the worldwide uh, push has been to change these narrative reports into increasingly sophisticated synoptic reports and the level six essentially is uh, is a, a reports that also incorporate uh, standardized terminologies like the SNOMED ICD etc and so on and uh, we have implemented this in a phased manner in Tata Memorial Center. So we, my colleagues actually did this analysis to see whether synoptic reporting has helped. There is a lot of resistance to every change in every institution. And so these are several parameters that pathologists should report on, on, on pathology. And you can see the last bar in each of these figures is actually the synoptic module. So reporting has the completeness of reporting has significantly improved uh, with the adoption of synoptic module, including several features that should be routinely reported by all pathologists. And what is better, the turnaround time is actually less uh, with synoptic reporting. So uh, this again, this will lend itself to that. This can lend itself to digital health initiatives uh, uh, of many kinds. Uh, this is the last uh, example of a digital health initiative that I will share with you. Uh, uh, I'm the principal. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Yes. Gupta. You have uh, three more minutes. Yeah. OK, perfect. I'm towards the end of my slides. So we aim to look at the occurrence and frequencies of comorbidities such as hypertension and diabetes in our patients. Uh, now you know that uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes, hypothyroidism, etc. can be written in a variety of ways on the EMR. So uh, we have all these sources uh, for extracting data on comorbidities. Uh, we will extract the relevant medical entities from the existing EMR data using an ETL framework, OCR pipeline and natural language processing engines. This data will be transformed into standard common data models and then will be loaded uh, onto the relevant CDM framework. And uh, this is in 30,000 patients. This is a proof of concept study. If we are able to do this, we can build a common data model from relatively unstructured EMR and other data for a variety of conditions. So this.
number of uh, publications from Tata Memorial Center in the field of AI and digital health. I do not need to go into the details of each one of them. Um, what does the future hold? All of us think that digital health, artificial intelligence and related themes have already arrived. This is a meta-analysis of the comparison of deep learning uh, against healthcare professionals in reading radiology images. Analysis, the deep learning models achieved equivalent levels of diagnostic accuracy. A more recent meta-analysis on mammograms and you can see that the false positive rates by the AI algorithm is much higher than human readers. And despite all the hype and hoopla, the conclusion at least of this particular analysis is that current evidence in breast cancer screening is of insufficient quality and quantity for implementation into clinical practice. The reason why I, why I show this is because there is a lot of work to do uh, 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 to enable the fruits and uh, and the uh, and the benefits of digital health to actually reach clinical. This is a slide that has been shared by Dr. Swaptel Rane. This essentially suggests I'll not go into the details. This essentially suggests that digital health and artificial intelligence algorithms are likely to complement humans rather than supplant them. I'm done, Dr. Mukhopadhyay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Gupta, for a very interesting and informative talk. Uh, so uh, we'll go to the questions. So there are some questions already typed up in the uh, chat box. The first is by Professor Amit Sethi. So Amit, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gupta, how much of the low incidence of cancers in low and medium income countries can be attributed to under detection and under reporting? Um, maybe only a small proportion, at least in India, because uh, aside from everything else, India has a long standing history of having a very robust cancer registration system. We have several population based cancer registries run by the ICMR that are of high quality, at least with respect to incidence, maybe not for mortality. And so the numbers for India are fairly are fairly accurate. There may be a little bit of under detection, but for the most part, these are the real numbers. Thank you. This, this may not necessarily be true of many other countries, but in India, we have a very nice registration system for cancers. So the so, next question is by Professor Ganesh Ramakrishnan. Ganesh, uh, could you ask your question? Yes, uh, Dr. Sudeep uh, Gupta, thanks for an excellent and comprehensive presentation. You talked about the online decision aid. So what were the modality choices for the questionnaire? Like, did you do audio and text? And if it was audio, we have faced a lot of problem with accent, right? So um, what were the, how did you get uh, the patients to seamlessly you know, uh, enter their information? their preferences, their so, feedback. So the way this was done, so one limitation of the study was that this only uh, the patients who were literate enough to read the slides and the information were only included and illiterate. I mean, this was not for illiterate patients. So the way this was done was patients were were administered the decision aid in a language that they could read. This was not an audio. This was reading. They went through the PowerPoint presentation. They clicked and the next, next, next. And at the end of the decision aid, they they filled out a research questionnaire, uh, which could measure the decisional conflict regarding regarding the two types of surgeries. So you are right that uh, this uh, this did require patients to be literate enough to read the decision aid, the information in the decision aid. Thanks. And a very quick question: the CAIB will also include. PET CT scans. I probably missed that. Yes, it, it will include it. radiology and radiology of all kinds, mammograms, MRI, uh, PET CT scans, as well as pathology images. So Thanks. the radiology is fairly straightforward because we have a PAX and the DICOM format has already been in existence for a long time. Pathology is a little more challenging because an image archival methodology that is accepted by everybody worldwide 
does not exist in pathology and for the most part pathology is still the physical slides under the microscope rather than digital pathology. Thanks. Uh, so are there any more questions? Uh, if not, then we will move on to the next talk by Mr. Girish Raghavan. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, just a moment, uh, please. Sorry for the interruption. Sure. Is my screen visible? Yes. 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 OK, thank you. Is the sound is uh, coming or not? No, the there is no sound. There is no sound. There is no yeah. sound. Oh, let me share again. Hopefully it will come now. What about now? No, there is no sound. So should I introduce him uh, without the video? That check. Give me a last try. OK. Ladies and Let gentlemen, it. our next. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Girish Raghavan, who joins us from GE Healthcare. Currently, Mr. Girish is the Vice President of Digital Platforms with Engineering and GE Healthcare India Technology Center. He has completed his Master's in Business Administration from Bhartia University. Currently, he leads the yeah. Global Engineering for Edison Platform a strategic project for GE Healthcare. He also leads the technology mandate for GE Healthcare in India and South Asia. His role includes interaction with key clients, partners, academia, and trade bodies. He has served in multiple engineering and technology leadership roles in GE for over 20 years across software, hardware, systems, service, and digital engineering departments. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Mr. Girish Rakhwa. Hi, Mr. Girish Raghavan. So I would now like to invite you for your talk. Uh, so Mr. Girish, you have 30 minutes for your talk, followed by five to 10 minutes of questions and answers. So over to Mr. Girish. OK, so thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And uh, before I start, I would really like to uh, uh, thank uh, KCDH as well as IIT Bombay for uh, firstly inviting me for this uh, presentation and giving me an opportunity. Um, I can clearly see that uh, you know, KCDH and uh, 
IIT Bombay is doing some phenomenal work in this space. So firstly, congratulations to this team. Uh, so what I will do in the next 30 minutes or so, I would give you an industry perspective to look at the sessions of the last few, um, what has been planned and what happened just before, are more from a clinical perspective as well as from, um, from research perspective, right? So I'm just going to give you a, a market view. It's more of an outside-in perspective of how the market is evolving, what's happening, what are the big trends we are seeing in the industry. So uh, I have five, five pages, which should be good enough. So let me share my screen and let me know once you can see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. 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 So uh, the, the topic of my uh, discussion today is about the healthcare market themes, uh, especially in the space of digital. The challenges we are going to we are facing and the big trends we are seeing in the industry. So uh, I would like to probably start with uh, the key themes in the healthcare market today. So broadly, if you look at pretty much all the healthcare companies uh, uh, in India and maybe in this planet are focusing on so on four key themes. One is uh, access and capacity. Uh, so every year we have around 160 million people uh, in the world who come from poverty to middle class and with them with that comes the propensity to pay right but today unfortunately our healthcare systems are not elastic enough to accommodate this 160 million who are coming in, coming on that's exactly why you see huge queues in hospitals and and this uh, tire one tire two urban versus rural rural uh, no um, imbalances is all coming to access and capacity right so that's a very pertinent problem the industry is facing today second is waste right there's a lot of productivity waste uh, in the healthcare system today. It is said that you no know, 20% of the healthcare expenses in OECD countries are all waste, right? It is just waste because uh, you do a lot of overtreatment, misdiagnosis, and so on and so forth. Right? The third uh, big uh, theme which the industry is grappling with is about the, the technology, uh, the expertise required. So we have uh, the number of the experts we have today in the industry is very limited. Uh, so as a consequence, you find that uh, a lot of physicians goes go through significant professional burnouts. Uh, this could be, uh, you know, could be a radiologist, could be a doctor, could be a nurse, could be anybody in the healthcare ecosystem. They go through tremendous amount of pressure. I don't know how many of you even realized that right? COVID time was something which people saw it in uh, at face value. But uh, there's been always significant burnouts in this uh, in this segment. So there are two issues here. One is there are less experts. As a consequence, they get burned out. Second is that there are less people who can have the level of expertise what is required either, right? So as a consequence, the whole system is very, uh, very complex. The last one is clinical outcomes, right? So as most of you know, right, uh, medical errors is the third largest cause of death in the US uh, after cardiovascular and oncology, right? This is the third largest one. Uh, it's around 10-ish percentage is what uh, is medical errors contributing. And again, medical errors is because of same thing, right? If you go to a, a hospital and see, you know, a radiologist would be going through some 100 X-rays or 100 CT scans in a day, right? He's probably spends two to three minutes on a report. And when he does continuously from morning to evening, right? Uh, you, you are bound to make some errors as we go forward, right? I know of cases where people would have missed a small lesion in a, in a PET scan. And six months later, when it becomes bad, really worse, you go back and look at the PET scan done six months back. And with a lot of multiple analysis, you find that there could have been, uh, somebody could have spotted it on much early on, right? So this is broadly the, uh, the healthcare market uh, themes and trends we are seeing today. Um, and then uh, coming to the challenges, right? Challenges are actually changed dramatically uh, in the post-COVID world. Of course, right? There's a big um, ask of social distancing. Uh, so it is said that about 35 percent of all the uh, interactions between the physician and the patient, the first interaction between physician and patient is going to be virtual. I don't think any of you here would even uh, would have thought that a day would come in the pre-COVID era that you would have your appointment with the doctor virtually, right? Uh, even my dad, who's 80 plus, right? Uh, he's very comfortable to get on a video call, uh, on a WhatsApp video call with uh, with a doctor and get, get his uh, consultation done, which is something I could have never thought of in the pre-COVID world. So social distancing is also driving that kind of behavior where doctors are asking folks to you know, try to um, uh, log in remotely. And now uh, COVID is, uh, is vanning down. You'll find that the same trend is going to continue. The second um, challenge we are facing today is there's a lot of distributed points of care. Uh, so if you look at, we have uh, all these big hospitals, um, uh, like um, uh, like we have an outsourced lab. Uh, if you look at the apartment where I live, right? So Apollo has set up, a, uh, I would say, an outpost uh, in my apartment. So, so people in my apartment who want to get a basic blood test done or 
uh, you want some very basic consultation and they don't go to the big hospital they go to the uh, small clinic which has been established in my apartment for all their day-to-day -day work so that is becoming a norm today so outpatient imaging centers outsourced labs shared icu so there's basically uh, two big trends over here distributed points of care like the one i ex explained and then virtualization of care as well right so uh, so that is the second trend the third big challenge you're facing today uh, in the healthcare segment is which everything getting uh, becoming virtual uh, you have virtual visits like the one example i mentioned to you you have a lot of work happening on remote patient monitoring which is a very important area uh, especially if you look at uh, today uh, in large hospitals there's an acute shortage of beds uh, so if you have a thousand bedded hospital, five hundred bedded hospital, there are there are people waiting to occupy the same same beds. And just because uh, the doctors cannot monitor the patient, they have the patient to stay in the hospital for a long period of time. So I know one of one of the folks I have been um, interacting with, uh, he had a stroke. He went to a, a leading hospital. Uh, it took him four days and he was fine. Uh, but the doctor asked him to stay for three more days extra just because he said that he has no way of monitoring this patient. Um, so just imagine the consequence, right? The patient is in, a, in the hospital for no reason. The expense goes up. Uh, he gets frustrated being in hospital because you know, going back would probably take make him feel much better. There are, there are probably 10 patients waiting for the same bed. So the whole philosophy of uh, remote patient monitoring, which is gaining a lot of traction today, is very compelling because uh, through remote patient monitoring, the patient can go back home and the doctor sitting at, at, uh, at a central uh, location can keep monitoring the data coming from all these patients and then uh, take actions as required. So remote patient monitoring, remote radiology reading is a challenge today as well. So today, uh, with less and less radiologists we have today in the industry today in hospitals, we have radiologist, one radiologist taking care of five or six hospitals in some cases, and uh, he cannot uh, travel to all the hospitals in a given day. So uh, assuming that he's sitting in a in a remote place, and then you he can he can remotely you know monitor all the hospitals what what is available in his purview is going to significantly improve his productivity. So from a challenge perspective, this is the this is the reality today, right? The healthcare delivery system has uh, significantly transformed in the last couple of years uh, through uh, virtualization of care to distributed points of care, virtual visit, remote patient monitoring, etc. And that is where the whole space of digital health is going to significantly make an impact. So uh, if you look at some of the uh, big uh, trends we are seeing in the post-COVID world, so these are some of the uh, you know, top eight trends uh, which uh, we collated from multiple journals and um, multiple, uh, I would say, um, uh, consultancy companies. But I would try to pick a couple of big things, right? One uh, is obviously the whole um, focus on telehealth, telemedicine is going to become the new standard of care. Uh, as I was explaining in my previous meeting, previous presentation, so home diagnostics, remote monitoring, all these things are really going to be the, the norm, right? It is not going to be the COVID era. It is going to continue for, for in the days to come, in the years ahead as well. Okay, that is one big thing. Second, we are, we are seeing uh, hospital financial uh, distress and consolidation. It happened in the last couple of years. It's going to continue in the next few years as well, right? Hospitals are facing significant uh, you know, financial uh, stress today. Uh, is because of multiple things, right? Because uh, the hospitals traditionally are with uh, running with low margins. So we are going to see significant amount of hospitals getting consolidated over the, over the years to come. Right? That's going to become become the norm. Uh, there's, of course, there's a, a strong increase in demand for AI, uh, especially as the decision support system. And this is very important for us, right? If you if, if, if take the example of what I was referring to earlier, if you take the life of a radiologist, he logs in into his uh, system at 10 a.m. in the morning, he would perhaps go through some you know, some 100 CT scans or 100 X-rays in a day. Just I'm assuming that we use uh, good AI technologies where the AI system can pass through the entire uh, you know, 100 uh, reports what he has got and is able to boil up the ones where he's seeing a, uh, seeing a, a potential issue that is going to increase the productivity significantly. Right. So we have solutions today in the market where using artificial intelligence, we're able to look at tons of CTs and MRs and uh, X-ray systems, and be able to bring uh, bring up, boil up the ones which have a problem. So typically the guy would spend his most productive time looking at those abnormal uh, scans, and he would spend the other uh, after lunch time, perhaps, right, looking at the reports which are potentially normal, right, is more about reporting and conclusion. So if you look at a typical CT X-ray, out of 100 X-rays you do, maybe, you know, 90% of them are normal, only 10% needs the attention 
uh, what what is required. So we are seeing an increased demand in AI uh, across the healthcare segment, uh, and that is going to continue as well. Uh, it, it's more towards uh, decision support systems. We are also seeing a lot of partnership with medtech and pharma. You would have seen in the in, in news uh, multiple times the last couple of years. A lot of med so traditionally medtech and pharma were two separate segments. Pharma was a large black box. Okay. Uh, Medtech has a lot of data with them, like uh, you know, you have CTs and MRs and extra, etc. The data is very, very crucial. Uh, thanks to COVID, uh, the typically uh, when a vaccine takes 10 years to develop and mature and evolve, uh, in the COVID phase it has to get get compressed in a couple of years, right? And they need a lot of data to make this happen. So the partnership within Medtech and Pharma is going to be uh, significantly helpful in uh, making sure that we're able to take healthcare uh, much faster um, as we go forward. Uh, then with all these virtual care, remote monitoring, etc., there's a lot of concern on cybersecurity. So you're going to see a lot of traction on cybersecurity uh, as this whole uh, space of telehealth is going to expand. Uh, so, so there's a lot of focus from, from companies like G Healthcare, and I'm sure with, with every company today working in the healthcare space on how do we strengthen cybersecurity to make sure we don't have data loss, we don't have uh, privacy issues, uh, that, I, that the systems are not getting compromised and so on and so forth. So that is definitely going to continue as a trend. The other big trend we are going to see in the post-COVID world is also about interoperability, right? So look at the previous page where I explained about a, a, a remote radiologist sitting at home and looking after 10 different hospitals, right, uh, in a city. It is impossible for him to expect that all the 10 hospitals would have the same IT systems what, what we have. So it's possible that every ten, every, each of the 10 hospitals have their own IT systems, they have their own viewers, they have their own systems, they have their own cyber security, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this whole question of interoperability becomes all the more important because you need systems to work with each other much closely than ever, right? If you want to really build a very vibrant ecosystem. And lastly, the regulatory uh, framework is going to become extremely crucial. Reimbursements uh, have to be as to as to change. The I've seen the regulatory uh, bodies across the globe have uh, actually uh, become more flexible in terms of taking into account the virtual uh, services which are getting provided, which is a good news. At the same time, uh, um, the the reimbursement models also have. We are seeing a lot of changes happening globally to to take into account the new trends we are seeing today in the industry. So these are some of the uh, large trends I would say which we are seeing today in the healthcare segment, uh, and this will going to continue in the post-COVID uh, world as well. Coming to what G Healthcare is doing, right? I just want to have a couple of pages to talk specifically about uh, G Healthcare. So G Healthcare is actually trying to make uh, the system smarter. To some extent, it is I would say more like Tesla. I would say so. If you look at uh, uh, if you look at the auto auto industry. Uh, we're going towards uh, driverless cars and so on and so forth. I don't think we'll get there in healthcare in anywhere in the near future. But what we are trying to do is we are using AI uh, kind of technologies uh, and deep learning kind of uh, uh, technologies to help to um, uh, to predict much faster. So to give an example, right? Uh, we are trying to make the CT uh, the example what I have here, right? We're trying to make uh, a CT or an MR smarter as we go forward. So the idea here is that uh, we will have AI systems uh, inbuilt in these products. So the systems are smart enough that it can tell the operator what to do. So if you look at the traditional uh, interaction between an operator and the equipment, the operator would tell the equipment what to do, and the equipment would do exactly what the operator tells. The assumption here is that the equipment is dumb, right? In the systems, what we are doing in GE, which we have released today, the system is so smart, the system would tell the operator what to do, right? So for example, it's possible, it, today we have systems which we have released where the CT system, uh, when you have a patient on the table, the CT system would go back and look at the hospital information system, we look at the EMR records, we look at the radiology uh, records, et cetera, and would recommend to the operator, look, I've seen this patient, this patient is obese, this patient has these histories. And for this patient, I would recommend that you use one of the three protocols what you have, right? So the technologists can go and choose the right protocol, uh, so which is optimal in terms of dose, uh, which, which will give the right image quality for the for the radiologist, right? If you look at today or in the in the pre uh, pre world, you have we used to have the technologists call up the radiologist. Okay, the radiologist might be busy in something else, right? And you have a patient on the table, so in in more often than not, the, the technologist would use his is uh, guesswork, right, or his experience to get things done is very, I would say, um, very uneven in terms of uh, the quality of images. What you get with uh, technology like what you, what I mentioned here is going to significantly help. The 
uh, so the idea here is to make the system smart enough. The system can tell the tell the operator. So if you look at today, the GE systems can in fact tell the operator if the patient is moving, right? So if you look at some of these scans, if the patient moves too much, the image will be very very uh, distorted. Uh, dis uh, so the the system can go and tell the technician, look, I think the patient has moved too much. Maybe you want to do a rescan, right? So there's a lot of uh, intelligence we are building the system to help the patient experience be much more smoother. At the same time, making sure the quality of care is significantly uh, uh, improved. And this is all the more important, especially when we go to tier two or tier three cities, right? Uh, especially in India, where we do not have a sub adequate trained technologist or radiologist, where these systems would be able to uh, help the technologist and the radiologist much more than ever, right? So, uh, so the quality of care can be maintained as well. So, so to do this, to make the system smarter, obviously we need a lot of applications which are intelligent. So, so if you look at the examples I have mentioned here, uh, some of the examples we have here, these are uh, trying to make the application smarter. Uh, and to do this, we need data, right? So what we are doing in G Healthcare is we have this, uh, what we call the Edison platform, uh, which is part of the digital health portfolio, what we have. So we actually provide uh, developer services. So if if you are a startup, right, or if you are uh, a, 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 um, a company who wants to build applications, we provide uh, development kits which the company can leverage and build applications using the services what we provide. And they would make applications which are smarter and intelligent, which will sit on the device. So we provide the entire suite of applications through the uh, digital health portfolio uh, under Edison uh, platform using which uh, a startup or a healthcare company or a healthcare provider can build applications which will bring good amount of intelligence uh, into the system, which will, uh, as a consequence, make the uh, system smarter and uh, efficient. So the whole focus here has been on how do we make the entire end-to-end -end workflow uh, seamless and efficient. Okay, so this is at a high level. Some of the uh, some of the work we are, we have been doing on the in the space of digital health. Now coming to uh, uh, why G Healthcare is well positioned, right? So uh, when you talk about digital health, obviously it plays a very important role. So um, from our from our perspective, what we have been doing is that uh, so we have more than four million units worldwide today across imaging, mobile diagnostics, and monitoring. We are perhaps one of the few companies in the world which has got so much of systems installed globally, right? Uh, and we are present in 160 countries in the world. So obviously you have huge variation of data which you can get over a period of time, right? And we also have a lot of volume, right? As we speak every minute, somewhere in some part of the world, uh, there is there are 16,000 images being generated on a G healthcare equipment. And every year we do more than 2 billion scans uh, on a G equipment. So all this actually provides us the kind of experience required to build the kind of applications what we were referring to in the previous page, okay? So that's at a high level, uh, some of the uh, key topics uh, which I which I had uh, to share with you. Uh, but before I, uh, I conclude uh, the 30 minutes talk, I have a video for five minutes, which I want to uh, briefly uh, put on screen. Uh, let me know if you're able to hear me. Are you able to hear the volume? Yes. Okay. So this video actually talks about uh, how, uh, how digital health would be in the future. So as we go forward with all the technology innovations, what we are doing today, uh, both in healthcare, uh, G healthcare, and also across the industry, you'll find that the technology is going towards the direction. This could be a quick glimpse of how imaging would look like in 2030 or 2040. Again, this is not something, uh, it's not that G is working on all these technologies, but some of these things are uh, good indications to where the industry is going to going towards. Okay. The world changes, but some things never change. Difficult moments can make time stand still, but love can make a lifetime pass in the blink of an eye. You said I'd understand that someday, and then I blinked. And you were gone. Alarm off. Good morning, Sophie. How did you sleep? You tell me, Oz. 447 minutes of confirmed sleep. 34.2% REM. Slept like a baby. Increase floor temperature. Increase in floor temperature. And start me a slow drip, will you? I'm going to take a shower. Of course, Sophie. Oh, 
I have scheduled for you an appointment at the micro clinic. Your full medical history and self exam results from this morning have been confirmed, received, and your primary care doctor, Lynn's Children's, has been notified of your appointment. Sophie, we've been expecting you. I'm Lily, your technologist. Let me show you to your personal pod. Mom, where do I begin? Our pods will help put you at ease. They're equipped with sensory... I remember you telling me how you would sing to me before I was born. It's going to be okay. Before we do any further testing, we're going to go over the results of your self-exam. But first... Let's give you the sensory atmosphere you requested, shall we? That you were convinced it was why I have such great taste in music. Step up to the scanner and relax your body. Remain still. And three, two, one. Good. Lift your arm above your head. Remain still. And three, two, one. Good. How the mere thought of me was all it took for love to grow stronger than anything you'd ever known. The invisible things that consume us. Love. The fear you had dealing with this and how different it is for me today. You look great. <laughs> all right, now you're just going to lay down for me. Facing the very same thing that took you from me. You told me once we can look so deeply into ourselves that we miss what's most important. So I'm afraid the MRI does show a suspicious lesion in the left breast. Based on appearances and outputs from the artificial intelligence application, probability of malignancy is high. That's the not so good news. The good news is that we caught it early and when we look at I've been data, thinking about that lately. Predict an excellent outcome for you. But I see something now that was harder for you to see back Let's talk then. About next steps. Hope. Hope in the world that surrounds me, in the people here to guide me through. You told me it was something I'd find when I needed it most. And I have. Sophie, you've got a really good team here. Um, as I told you before, I think things are looking really good. Oh. Hi, Mom. How's the news? What I hope for. <sighs> Look at her. <laughs> I just wish you could be here today to see it and to meet your great granddaughter. She has your smile. Everything is set for tomorrow's party, Sophie. <laughs> GE believes in the power of emerging technologies to advance precision health and transform patient care. The outlook for healthcare has never been brighter. So, uh, so, so, so if you look at what I was trying to conclude with the video is that the potential for digital health and technology is uh, very compelling as we go forward. Right? Today we are at a very initial stage. Some of the examples I told you about. Uh, about intelligent protocoling or, or protocol management and you no know, systems being intelligent enough to tell the technicians what to do, what not to do, et cetera, are uh, uh, actually at a very initial stage. Though may, they may look wow for us at this point in time, but what is ahead of us is very, uh, very solid. Okay, so just, just, just give us a glimpse of the potential in front of us. So I know I'm already 30 minutes into the, in the meeting, so I'll pause here and I'll open up for questions from the team. Uh, thank you, Mr. Girish, for a very interesting and informative talk about how GE Healthcare's technology innovations are helping Indian healthcare system, particularly in this difficult COVID times. Uh, so, uh, questions uh, from the audience? Any questions? 
Um, I had posted a question. I can read that out, Girish. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, oh. so, given privacy concerns, could you comment on you know federated storage, federated management, also federated AI across the data that you said is lying with you know medtech, pharma, as well as hospital data, right? Uh, and and you talked about the um, Edison platform. So either through Edison platform or the, otherwise, have you been looking at federated learning? And I think there's all the more critical because you know. Assuming the data interoperability and other concerns, um, and sanity checking through your intelligent applications that you spoke about, all that is taken care of. I would leave, we would eventually like to uh, reduce the computational overhead as well as preserve privacy. Yeah. Any suggestions? Oh, yes, definitely. I think Anish is a good point. So we're, we're doing some work around federated learning as well, a big time. In fact, we are partnering with uh, one of the companies uh, in the US uh, in this space. So uh, again, the philosophy here is that the data stays wherever it is. See, hospitals have their own constraints as well uh, because they don't. You, there are there are regulations at an hospital operating system level. There are regulations at a country level as well, right? Uh, each country has got diff different uh, no, um, re regulations on data privacy and security. So the federated learning has been very uh, helpful for us, Ganesh. Right? We have uh, we are working on some projects where we have the algorithm will go to the uh, the place where the data resides. It will execute on it and come back. So data would continue to stay where they are. So we are doing some work on federated learning. We're doing some work on uh, um, on security around that space as well. So this is definitely a very a very solid uh, thing for us to work on. Thanks, Girish, and thanks for a nice talk. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I, ha I have a question. So are there any plans for uh, introducing, let's say, new versions of uh, the MRI and CT equipment that can be better adopted due to a lower price point uh, in low and medium inter income countries? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, see, definitely see there is a lot of uh, I would say um, misconception today, Amit, in the industry, right? That with AI, etc., cost is going to go up. In fact, it's on the contrary, right? Because what's going to happen is uh, the cost of the hardware would come down dramatically, right? Uh, especially when you have AI. See, for example, if you don't have AI, the kind of computational power you would need is going to be significantly higher. Reducing AI kind of technology is going to come down. So definitely, we are going to see cost, uh, not not right in the short term, but at least in the mid term. Uh, cost would definitely come down and then comes the power of cloud right so today uh, if you look at in current situation today uh, amit we have uh, the computation computers right should be so high powered to work on the worst case situation right today the kind of work we're doing today in g healthcare we use clouds very uh, to an advantage where we have the local computing happening at the nominal stage but whenever there's a high computational need you would leverage the cloud, cloud where you have elasticity available there you can take more compute for a short period of time right so this kind of hybrid computing which is still in its early stage today in a lot of uh, industries uh, once you have the hybrid compute computing uh, systems in place right uh, it's going to definitely help in getting the cost uh, much more uh, uh, lower the third thing we're doing as a company is also, Amit, we're trying to make our system much more simpler. Uh, like one example of uh, the CT system what we released um, a couple of years back, right? Um, so we actually reduced the number of clicks by 80%. Okay. Uh, so what happens is today, if you look at a, a high end uh, or a older CT system, you have so many buttons, right? It needs a level of competence uh, at a much higher level to operate. It's like operating a aeroplane, right? You need so many, so many buttons and you know, you know how, what to use, what not to use. So we have actually done a lot of workflow map mapping. We work with some 250 uh, clinicians uh, in, in India and we identify what are the basic things that are required and removing we removed completely. And everything is behind the scene. We use uh, you know, software technologies to automate a lot of these things, which actually need not need an operation intervention. So as a consequence, we have, we have found that the, the, uh, the competence required to operate the systems have come down. The cost has definitely come down because you don't need all this kind of high-end computing. And then we are also finding that the the, the the quality of care also also be much more uh, normalized uh, across the larger population. Thank you. Hi, this is Prasad here. I have a question. Sure. So just wanted to know: uh, Is there a way in which you know some of these systems in modular form or some way can you know be brought uh, in, let's say? Places like IIT Bombay and uh, researchers like Professor Mitsethi, Professor Ganesh can use the data to you know, refine the algorithms, etc. that they are working on. 
Yeah, so right now uh, we haven't opened it up, uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, at this point in time, but we have it in our in our planning, okay, because we are actually working with a couple of IITs as well, and we've been talking to a couple of your colleagues as well on this. So eventually we will do that. So the Edison platform by itself, uh, uh, Prasad, is a very powerful platform what we have built. So this platform uh, can be used by industries to build algorithms on top of that. So it is not subsets of the platform, but the entire platform by itself can be definitely provided. And we can we can talk about this for sure. OK, thank you. So in fact, across the world, uh, Dr. Prasad, there are a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, leading universities or uh, academic institutions using the Edison platform precisely for this, right? So we have gotten collaboration with uh, some of the universities, and they're using a platform to uh, uh, use their uh, AI models and train them and uh, test them. So we are doing some work with a lot of institutions, so definitely we can we can look at that. Okay. Thank you. I'll get in touch with you. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, okay. Th so thank you, Mr. Girish, for the talk. Uh, so we will move over to our last speaker, that is Dr. C. S. Pramesh. So now KCDH office will again play a short introductory video. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. C. A. S. Pramesh from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Pramesh is the director of Tata Memorial Hospital and the professor and head of thoracic surgery at Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. He is the convener of the National Cancer Grid, a large network of over 170 cancer centers in India. Also, he is a visiting professor at the Division of Cancer Studies, King's College London and the Institute of Cancer Policy, King's Health Partners, London. Dr. Ramesh's primary clinical areas of interest include treatment of esophageal and lung cancers and minimally invasive surgeries. He also has a strong interest in clinical trial designs, surgical trials, comparative effectiveness research and promoting collaborative research and cancer policy. Dr. Pramesh is highly committed to efforts towards reducing the inequities in cancer care and making cancer treatment accessible to all geographic regions and strata of society. With these words, please join me in welcoming Dr. C. S. Pramesh from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. So now I would like to invite Dr. C. S. Pramesh to give his talk. Dr. Pramesh, you have 30 minutes for your talk and then we will follow it up with questions and answers. So over to Dr. Pramesh. Dr. You are on mute. You are on mute, Dr. Pramesh. Are you able to uh, see my slides now? Yes, see your slides and also hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, after two years, you'd think you'd get the tech right on, at least the audio and the video, but you never know. Anyway, thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, 
meeting today. And uh, as Sudeep said, very humbled by the opportunity to participate in something to commemorate uh, somebody who's been an extraordinary collaborator uh, with the Tata Memorial family, uh, Professor Inti Banerjee. And uh, again, uh, it's a privilege to be here. So uh, one of the risks of speaking after one of your own uh, colleagues in the same institution is that there is so much in common. So I've had to do a very rapid revision of my slides in the last half an hour after Sudeep spoke just to avoid overlap between what he spoke and uh, what I did. And I'm hoping that I'm able to present some new uh, thoughts for your uh, uh, discussion. So the next half an hour, what I'll do is to speak about what we mean by digital health. And I uh, do this deliberately, even in a forum like this, because this term is often uh, misinterpreted in very different ways by different people, depending on the stakeholder who's involved. I'll move on to how can technology help with the health. Uh, some key areas of digital health which have uh, promoted, uh, which have been promoted over the last uh, decade or two. Uh, some examples uh, which have shown the successes of how digital health can help and, uh, and some of our own uh, real life uh, examples. Uh, and uh, hopefully there should not be an overlap between what Sudeep uh, spoke about and mine. But I'll end with uh, some caveats uh, because I do understand that I'm preaching to the converted here. We have uh, champions of digital health and uh, it's often important and possibly probably necessary to uh, to have an idea of some of the limitations as well. And then finally summarize. So as I understand digital health, it's a very broad and uh, very interdisciplinary concept which basically stems from an intersection between technology and healthcare. And I do know that this is a rather vague definition, but it still does some justice to encompass the breadth of what we uh, discuss and what each of us interpret as uh, digital health. And uh, for this, we incorporate various combinations or standalone uh, solutions with software, hardware and services. And much of what I'm going to speak about over the next few minutes will deal with that. Uh, before we move on to what uh, digital health actually means, what the benefits are and some examples, it's important to, to remind ourselves that uh, there are several stakeholders uh, involved in this entire uh, uh, ex uh, exercise and uh, possibly uh, remember that uh, we need to keep patients at the center of everything that we do, but there is also a large a group of individuals, including physicians, uh, researchers, uh, application developers, technologists, uh, medical device manufacturers and distributors who all play a very important part. And depending on uh, which, which lens you look at this problem from, you have various solutions, not all of which might actually benefit the person we keep at the center of all of this. So with digital health technologies, these are some of the examples. I know this is a growing list. Uh, we start with electronic health records and medical records. Uh, I think COVID has brought the uh, concept of telehealth and telemedicine very strongly into the forefront of what uh, faces the consumer, in this case, the, uh, the patient. And uh, the revolution that we've had over the last uh, decade or so with uh, wearable devices, mobile health apps, and a growing emphasis on personalized medicine over the last two decades uh, are all uh, enabled by this concept of uh, digital health. So there are various potential benefits of digital health systems. Again, I do realize that uh, this is an extremely enlightened audience, but it, nevertheless, it's important to uh, to understand what these are and so, so that we are able to uh, speak the same language. The first and foremost uh, benefit of digital health systems is that it makes healthcare very sustainable and agile. As you heard the previous speaker say, uh, it has the potential to improve access and empowers patients in uh, taking ownership of their own health, taking care of some of their own uh, uh, health related problems and improving the concept of shared decision making. It shifts the focus of uh, health from health care to actually prom health promotion, prevention before uh, 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 care. And this is both to do with primary prevention, as you will see with some of those devices that you uh, uh, have with M health applications, but also the prevention of complications in people who have uh, uh, a particular uh, illness. And this is especially true for chronic diseases. When it comes to pre primary prevention, being able to uh, diagnose certain conditions early might, uh, might uh, push 
uh, the individual into more healthy lifestyles, thereby preventing the disease itself. And even in those who had a, a disease diagnosed, so for example, with diabetes, uh, there are several uh, digital health solutions which ensure that the disease doesn't progress to a situation where uh, the person ends up with retinopathy or nephropathy and uh, any of those uh, uh, kind of complications. It redefines the patient doctor relationship and this is something that's not often uh, realized when we come up with digital solutions. You have a wide spectrum of solutions, some of which which actually alienate the patient doctor relationship, but the a truly uh, beneficial digital health system should look at empowering patients and and encouraging shared decision making so that the doctor is in, in, in a sense empowered to have a more equal conversation with the patient and completely redefines the traditional paternalistic uh, relationship that we've had. And by doing so, it expands the reach of healthcare professionals, enabling them to focus on things which are truly uh, requiring of their skill set rather than get caught up in a lot of very routine, mundane and often repetitive uh, tasks and it clearly optimizes uh, clinician time. To me, the single most important aspect of digital health systems, and this is a filter which we probably need to run all our solutions through, and I don't think enough of that is being done in today's digital health world, is that it should reduce inequities in care rather than perpetuate them as some digital self solutions have actually ended up doing. And I think the education system that we've had thanks to the COVID lockdown and restrictions is a classic example of that. So online learning is something that should have democratized education, but on the contrary, thanks to the need for expensive and by expensive, uh, what is expensive to us, what is not expensive to us uh, uh, may well be expensive to the vast majority of the world's population. These are again aspects that we need to think about before we champion the successes of digital health uh, systems. And I'll come back to this uh, a little later in my talk. So who and how it can help is the entire uh, gamut of stakeholders that I mentioned earlier. And I particularly like this cartoon, which is uh, taken from the uh, Aishman Bharat digital mission, which looks at all possible stakeholders, but emphasizes something that is very fundamental to anything that is health related, which is to keep the general public and the patients at the center of everything that we do. Rather than find a solution and look for a problem uh, for the solution to solve, we, uh, so long as we again use this as a filter to decide where our priorities should be, I think uh, digital solutions can be a lot better. And let's see uh, how it can uh, help with each of these uh, stakeholders. With patients, as I mentioned earlier, it shifts the focus from uh, care to health promotion, prevention and uh, above actual treatment. Uh, we've heard about, we've already uh, seen the benefits of telehealth, how it enables patients uh, a lot more than it uh, uh, otherwise would have been. Uh, patients being the owners of their health records, the, uh, the very real world issue of loss of health records and uh, especially with images and the number of mobile health apps which have hit the market today. And again, I will add a word of caution here. Not all of them are regulated, not all of them are validated, and there is a need for caution when we look at these uh, health apps. But nevertheless, uh, these are solutions which are available and have transformed the way the general public as well as patients view uh, digital health. For physicians, uh, there are various examples of how it helps them. Decision support systems are only one of them. But again, uh, I would remind you of uh, the, the not so successful story of IBM Watson, which when it came out was touted to be the best thing that happened to physicians in sliced bread, but failed to live up to its promise for various uh, reasons. Patient reported outcomes, again, bringing the focus of uh, interventions onto the patient. Very often we look at scans, look at small re reductions in scans as a measure of success of cancer treatment. But what really matters to patients are just two things. Will I live longer and will I live better? And to answer the second question, patient reported outcomes are extremely important and an area where digital health can contribute quite significantly. Uh, we've heard previous speakers uh, talk about remote monitoring, again, uh, enabling access to the most rural of areas. And uh, the other advantage that it could potentially have physicians, especially physicians working in busy clinical situations like what we face in India, is to have user-friendly data presentation which summarizes a patient's longitudinal history into a uh, pictograph which can be uh, readily uh, uh, accessed. For researchers, this is a gold mine. Data is uh, the new oil. And this is a source of huge uh, uh, importance for researchers and the importance of having open data systems which enable more and more researchers to mine data and come up with 
uh, with newer findings from what the original researchers uh, envisioned is something that's extremely important. Having said that, the challenges of interoperability cannot be uh, overlooked and uh, I would urge anyone working on digital health systems and solutions to look at this as an essential ingredient of what they build or develop in the long term. And again, coming back to linkages between different uh, digital systems. For hospitals uh, in the administration, it improves systems. Uh, it offers the opportunity to see dashboards based on which processes and resources can be optimized so that the, the resources are put to the best uh, possible utility and not uh, in an ad hoc uh, manner. For healthcare systems, again, uh, digital health uh, offers a lot of benefits, uh, optimizes efficiencies. Uh, uh, it's a huge uh, resource for implementation science, bridging the gap between evidence and uh, real life uh, situations. And again, by promoting self care for patients, possibly decreases the burden on the healthcare system itself. And for policymakers, it offers them uh, the necessary data which uh, is required to guide health policy. So if you were to look at many of the health policies in low middle income countries like India, they have failed because of the lack of the reliable data to support them. And anytime you speak to a policy maker or a researcher in uh, countries like India, the constant uh, uh, lament that you hear from them is the lack of reliable quality data. And that's something that the digital health solution can plug and it really helps them prioritize uh, their uh, uh, next steps. So as I mentioned, uh, one thing that uh, the COVID pandemic taught us was the importance of telemedicine, though it was forced upon us at the beginning thanks to the restrictions. We have uh, grown to uh, realize the benefits of uh, uh, telemedicine by improving patient engagement, satisfaction, it improves access to healthcare, to expert opinions, to uh, reduce the cost of healthcare and overall bring uh, better treatment outcomes. So going by what the market is looking at, the, uh, it, it is expected to grow at a uh, CAGR of 26.6% and growing from 90 US bil uh, a billion US dollars to just under 300 uh, billion US dollars in just over five years, clearly demonstrating that telehealth and telemedicine is here to stay. M health is again something that uh, there is a lot of uh, been a lot of work on. Wearables have transformed the way we uh, we uh, we use devices. Uh, looking at the points like uh, heart rate variability, pulse oximeters, which came in very handy during the COVID pandemic, ECG monitoring, and I'll show you an example uh, subsequently, continuous glucose monitoring. And this is coming back to what I mentioned earlier, both with primary prevention of diseases like diabetes, as well as prevention of the complications of diabetes like retinopathy and nephropathy by continuous glucose monitoring. And by using these apps and mobile technology, it actually improves the access to uh, healthcare support and monitoring, which otherwise would not have been available for uh, the majority of users. So I'll give you this example of the Apple Watch, uh, a very nice uh, uh, study and a, a kind of a revolution which came out five years back in collaboration with Stanford Medicine researchers who looked at, uh, uh, at whether uh, the a wearable technology, in this case, the Apple Watch, could help detect atrial fibrillation, a form of uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmia earlier than what it would ha otherwise have been detected on a clinical basis. And what this study clearly showed was that the Apple Watch and the software integrated with it and the app that was it was linked to could actually detect irregular rhythm uh, suggestive of atrial fibrillation much before patients realized it, thereby enabling much earlier care being offered to these patients. I'll come back to this a little later when I point out the caveats of what we should think about when it comes to digital health solutions. This is another remarkable uh, success story in M health uh, looking at uh, uh, asthma management. So there is this really small sensor which uh, gets attached to most of the conventional inhalers which patients with asthma regularly use. And this uh, sensor and the app that is linked to the sensor gets multiple data inputs, not just from the sensor itself by way of breath volume and gas analysis, but also from routine weather reports, uh, which uh, the app was able to extract from other data sources. And with a combination of this data, it's actually able to predict the risk of developing an asthmatic attack and go to the point of suggesting which inhaler to use and what dose to use and at what frequency. So something which is completely in the patient's hand empowers the patient remarkably and without having to access a complex healthcare system helps with something which is a very uh, true real life problem. Uh, many previous speakers have spoken about artificial intelligence, uh, uh, the ability to, hu uh, to augment uh, human decision making by automation and speeding up what was otherwise repetitive or labor intensive tasks 
is at the heart of what AI is all about. But patient monitoring tools where uh, data collection and treatment of patients is based on real time reports rather than uh, one time uh, uh, testing of data is something that has uh, uh, that has truly revolutionized several areas of uh, health. And this new exciting concept of uh, digital twins, which which acts as a model for medical devices and for patients, which would in a uh, much pre uh, uh, earlier than a beta version show how devices and uh, would work when uh, in, in uh, actual conditions and especially in relation to patients using them. Uh, just this is the tip of the iceberg as far as AI is concerned, and uh, uh, there's much more to uh, go. So a lot of things have been spoken about big data, and uh, just a very uh, layman's uh, uh, definition of this would be data that's too vast or complex to be understood by traditional means of data processing, bringing this very new brave world of machine learning algorithms. Probably not so new anymore, but nevertheless, we are learning uh, as we go. And this, uh, the, the importance that data scientists currently have in, uh, in analyzing this kind of data. And as you can see on the cartoon on the right, uh, the sources of these big data are very diverse, some of them being uh, extracted uh, uh, passively through existing data systems and some of them being inputted uh, 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 actively uh, using other uh, records. And if you look at most of these, for example, smartphones, wearable devices, electronic health records, these are all passive ways of extracting data, which all goes into this big uh, uh, pool from which meaningful uh, analysis can be made. Uh, the problems about big data is that th are the three V's. Uh, the first V being extraordinarily high volume. Uh, the second being that it moves at very high velocity and it, it spans the breadth of uh, the health industry's uh, pretty massive digital universe. But the problem also exists that because it is derived from many sources and the lack of standards in uh, data with many of these sources, including imaging devices, it is highly variable. And the result is that it becomes fairly complex to merge these big healthcare data into conventional databases and make sense out of them uh, without using uh, big data or AI. And therefore, uh, it, it is quite challenging to process. Uh, I don't want to go into too much depth about the uh, 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 possible applications of big data, but if you look at all the areas of health and healthcare, starting from preventive medicine to diagnostics to precision medicine research, uh, adverse event monitoring, uh, reduction of costs and population health. There are several examples that we've had from big data that uh, very easily plug into these problems, which are re very real life uh, problems as well. And going into more granular data, looking at medical imaging, going to as mundane tasks as improving supply chains, which came into the forefront with uh, the COVID pandemic when there was a universal shortage of various drugs, uh, personal protective equipment, masks and so on and going on to other uh, applications like self-harm pr uh, prevention, mental health, smart staffing of uh, healthcare providers, uh, reducing fraud, especially with uh, insurance claims and so on. Augmented reality, I believe, is something that's not been exploited as much as uh, it should be, though it forms a very integral part of digital health. Uh, learning systems where augmented reality has a huge role to play still haven't matured to the point of replacing real life learning. And to me, this is a shame because every pilot who learns to be a pilot goes through extraordinary simulation pro uh, exercises before they actually fly a plane on their own. Whereas with medicine and healthcare, most medical students learn on patients rather than using simulators. And this is something that has been hugely underused and undervalued as far as uh, learning processes are concerned. So I'll come to the final half of my talk, which is to focus on what should we really do to have impact in the real world. And to me, there is this huge disconnect between what most of the digital uh, health uh, community is working on and what is actually re uh, truly required in the in the real world and it comes down to this uh, issue of disparities and inequality we have in the world and i'll take a couple of minutes to explain what i mean by this if you look at the human development index uh, there's uh, plenty to be happy about if you look at the last 150 years starting from 1570 there's been remarkable progress practically in every region of the world but if you were to look at some of these countries and if you were to exclude the oecd countries and go down to something like sub-saharan africa latin america uh, uh, asia excluding uh, japan and china you see that the increments in the human development index haven't been dramatic 
Similarly, for uh, GDP per capita, if you were to look at uh, uh, states, uh, countries in uh, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and Western Europe, you see much dramatic, uh, much more dramatic increases in GDP as compared to other areas like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Middle East, and so on. This is a very sobering report, and for those of you who have not read this, I will earnestly urge you to go through this World Inequality Report, which came a month or two back which looks at global income and wealth inequality, and this is 2021 data. So what it effectively means is that the top 10% of the world, uh, of the, the top uh, richest 10% of the world uh, is responsible for 52% of the global income, whereas the bottom 50% account for just 8.5% of the world income. It is even more stark when it comes to wealth. The top 10% of the world uh, owns 76% of the of the global wealth and the bottom 50% own 2% of the global wealth. If you were to look at the concentration of uh, capital and wealth inequality across the world, you realize that the discrepancy between the richest and the poorest actually gets worse as the, uh, the, the income level of the country uh, uh, goes lower, which means that in countries like Latin America, MENA, Russia, Central Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, the discrepancy between the richest and the world actually widens compared to countries, uh, continent, uh, countries in Europe uh, and other parts of uh, uh, Asia. So clearly showing that inequality is real and even within low middle income countries, there is huge inequalities. And again, this is a graphical representation of the top, uh, bottom 50, top 10 income gaps across the world. So clearly showing that inequality. So what I'm talking about is not the top 10% who have access to the best solutions in the world, but the bottom 50% on whom I strongly believe that digital health solutions should be uh, focused upon. So I'll sh just show you a few examples of some real world uh, uh, situations where we decided to focus uh, within the Tata Memorial and the National Cancer Grid on where digital health solutions and these solutions might look rudimentary and very primitive to you in comparison to some of the examples that you saw earlier on, both by uh, in my own talk as well as by previous speakers. But when you look at impact, that is what we need to measure as uh, a true measure of whether a digital health solution is important or not. So to me, looking at real world problems, uh, very clear problem definition, offering realistic solutions and looking at the top 10 versus the bottom 50 percent. And I, I think Dr. Uh, Soumya, uh, when you look at uh, the, the, the cancer moonshot, which was uh, uh, launched with great fanfare by several organizations, including MD Anderson, the most recent by President Biden of the United States, what I would urge digital health to look at is while you, while you continue to look for uh, moonshots, also look at earth shots, which is uh, looking at real life, real world problems and finding solutions to them. So some of the initiatives that we've been involved in within the National Cancer Grid has to be has been to look at quality assurance in surgical pathology, which is looking at web enabled services where quality assurance and a system of accreditation of member centers within the National Cancer Grid is enabled with over 150 centers participating in this quality assurance program. So by doing a very simple intervention of improving the quality of pathology reporting, you're automatically transforming the care that you offer to hundreds of thousands of patients across the length and breadth of the country. We more recently expanded this uh, quality assurance program to include molecular pathology as well. The next point that I want to talk about is online learning. Uh, we have uh, the NCG uh, uh, quality improvement program, which is a blended learning program. Learning is something that most people don't think about when it comes to digital health, and this is something that I strongly urge all of you to think, not just by blended learning and online learning courses. We also have um, we also have uh, uh, simulations, we have uh, uh, augmented reality to supplement these, mimicking a real life situation much better than what we otherwise would. Uh, Sudeep did speak briefly about the expert opinion service. This is again a web enabled service from the Tata Memorial and the National Cancer Grid, where we offer expert opinion service uh, with, uh, uh, which is based both on AI, based on available evidence collated from the top trials, clinical trials in the world, but also looks at uh, patient, at uh, uh, expert oncologists' opinions to further refine their choices. Uh, tumor boards, which started much before COVID, though this became popular in many parts of the world during COVID, we started six or seven years back. We've had over 600 tumor boards which have been conducted so far within the National Cancer Grid, which not only benefits the patient whose clinical case is getting discussed, but also uh, serves as a continuing medical education program for uh, those who are involved in participating in this. 
looking at very simple solutions like uh, like uh, uh, collating library resources through a discovery tool, making it very searchable, thereby democratizing cancer education uh, across the National Cancer Grid members. Uh, a massive open online course which we run under the ncgeducation.in portal where we collate educational material from several of the NCG centers and thereby dis help disseminate this again democratizing uh, medical education. So this is an effort that we are fairly proud of. Uh, this is something which we started as a proof of concept working on patient health records and interoperability uh, two or three years back where we looked at a very simple pi pilot project which we were able to prove that with three different electronic medical record systems we were able to aggregate using uh, patient mock patient data and patient consent management getting it into a gateway where uh, uh, we we enabled the the very different data sources to be combined into one source and though this this was not converted into a format which made it analyzable it nevertheless was one step forward in aggregating disparate patient uh, health records into one service and this uh, has now gone on to be the heart of what the national digital health mission is working towards uh, and uh, developing further i did mention to you about the equic program which is the quality uh, uh, assurance program if you look at the impact that we've had we've trained 32 uh, teams in quality improvement across the country with over 200 uh, professionals so we've utilized this and based on this, we've had 64 of these professionals being certified as quality insurance, uh, quality improvement uh, leaders, and thereby making a uh, exponential increase in the in the value that quality is uh, uh, done uh, across the national cancer. And we do this in collaboration with uh, the Stanford Medicine Group. Uh, impact uh, head neck is another integrated module on palliative care. Again, dissemination of uh, palliative care knowledge and information across uh, various professionals. Before I end, I want to focus a bit on the problems and I'll take you through a few of them just to illustrate uh, uh, the, the fact that digital health is all not rosy and we need to run it through several filters before we embrace this as uh, the next best thing. We do realize that uh, health data is very clunky and uh, the fact that it comes from very varying sources, many of whom do not have standards of collecting data does make this very difficult to combine into a common database. And this is probably something that uh, industry um, uh, device manufacturers and the regulators probably should put some thought into to have uniformity of uh, data creation as well as uh, collation. The lack of quality data and the privacy concerns are aspects which many uh, previous speakers have already spoken about, but again, important to realize that these are issues that we need to address the lack of common standards when it comes to uh, deriving or accessing data from devices, the interoperability between these devices as well as electronic uh, medical records, uh, the validation, and I'll come to that with the final example uh, a bit later, where often the technology overtakes the science and we often compromise the rigid uh, structure of how we do clinical trials for the sake of expediency and we allow surrogate markers which may not necessarily be true in the real life world. And I think uh, uh, in some areas we need to be conscious of the fact that tech may actually deepen disparities instead of uh, reducing them, which was the original goal. And I'm reminded of this uh, quote uh, which the uh, uh, chief scientist at WHO, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan made about digital technology. She said, if digital technologies are to be sustained and integrated into health systems, they must be able to demonstrate long term improvements over the traditional ways of delivering health services. So for all of us who are converged to digital health, this might seem a very rudimentary and a very uh, uh, basic uh, comment to make, but I think it goes to the heart of what public health systems are all about. It's no longer about the tech. It's no longer about whether there is there are incremental improvements in the technology, but unless you have an impact on the real world, uh, these digital health solutions are not really improvements. I'll come back to this example, which actually got published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Apple Watch uh, study. Uh, again, in collaboration between Apple, it was funded by Apple, run by the Stanford uh, Medicine researchers. Over 400,000 participants followed up over eight months with a median of 117 days, of which 0.5% received notifications, which meant that they had some abnormality in their uh, heart rhythm, which they received a notification for. And there was 84% concordance with atrial fibrillation, which is a potentially life-threatening uh, illness. So clearly showing that uh, even with a very uh, uh, strong technology, you need to validate them in the real world before uh, uh, adopting them as, as routine. But even after such a uh, story, uh, we 
very soon within two to three years of the study getting published in the New England Journal, we started getting uh, warning signals where uh, some limitations were identified which are not identified in the original study. Uh, another study which looked at whether uh, at uh, people uh, under the age of 55, which is actually the target age, right? I mean, these are the people who are most uh, uh, likely to wear these uh, devices. And in those, it failed much more than it did in those above the age of 55. And in people younger than 55, the Apple Watch positive predictive value was just under 20%. Though 84% concordance was achieved by the original study, the real life situation showed that in people younger than 55, it was a much lower positive predictive value. And again, uh, newer studies which show that uh, when your heart rate is over 120, which is a more risky kind of atrial fibrillation, the Apple Watch just can't catch it. So not only is the validation process important and needs to be robust, but following them up in the real world also is extremely important. And this is something that I will harp upon because this is something which is uh, not done when most newer technologies are adopted in the real world. So this is my final slide uh, to summarize. Uh, uh, I, I'm a big champion of digital health. It has uh, exciting possibilities to uh, practically all stakeholders. It truly has the potential to democratize health and healthcare. It benefits or has again the potential to benefit all the stakeholders involved in health, but quality, validation and access should be the filters that we run every single advance which we promote under digital health. And if it passes these three filters, uh, it's probably ready for uh, uh, prime time. And the most exciting part about digital health to me is that it can for many countries, especially the low middle income countries, it can help leapfrog an entire generation of medical advances, which high income countries have painfully gone through. And this is the exciting potential, which to me digital health is, is uh, clearly uh, the, the science of tomorrow. I'll stop with this for now and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Thank Dr. Pramesh, for a very interesting and informative talk, talk about digital health and the recent advance, advances in digital health. Uh, so uh, questions, uh, uh, any questions from the audience? As we wait for others uh, to ask questions, I'm always ready with some. So could I go ahead? Sunil? Yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Dr. Prabesh, for an excellent talk again. It's always a delight he hearing you. Um, just want a, a more general uh, question and a more general guidance on how, based on your NCG, especially the Equip India initiative. Um, uh, how do you uh, see uh, the different entities like uh, Institutes of Technology, KCDH specifically, right? Uh, you have NGOs on the other hand, foundations. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, there are many other foundations. Um, and there's government, central and state. Um, then there are hospitals. And I'm, I'm kind of mixing the frontline workers, ASHA workers with hospitals. But yes, you can also think, think of them as also two different buckets. And finally, the software industry, the professionals, right? And also consortiums in that on that front. How do they play complementary roles? Um, I think it's very important to identify this, maybe have some uh, discussion across them. Um, given that you know NCG in some sense has also been a seed for a ABDM, right? Um, uh, they've taken it as a strong precedent, but isn't it a uh, an important thing to discuss across the board and uh, and identify the roles they should be playing? Uh, most certainly, uh, and I think uh, right from uh, about two to three years after the NCG was initiated, we did realize this uh, the importance of doing so. So while uh, to be honest, when we started the NCG, it was meant to be. Uh, only cancer centers and that at the beginning only government cancer centers we have rapidly evolved over the last 10 years so we went on to include private uh, uh, healthcare providers as well because uh, we realized that a large part of india's uh, cancer management actually ha uh, happens in uh, private uh, sector then we moved on to include uh, research institutions so iit bombay for example is a member of the national cancer grid uh, there are several uh, standalone research institutions which are part of the National Cancer Grid, and I'm hopeful that KCDH also, independent of the IATB, will uh, uh, play an important role in the way the NCG evolves in digital health over the next uh, decade or so. And again, NGOs, uh, uh, our partnership with Aishman Bharat, our partnership with the uh, DBT, all of this emphasize that it is 
so, so no single player, whether it is a healthcare provider, a healthcare professional, government can uh, reach success on its own. And I'm very often reminded of this, and I do use this slide very often in my talks. Uh, the 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 teamwork that happens during a uh, Formula One uh, pit stop. So uh, Formula One pit stop uh, takes about 2.3 seconds, and in, over the course of 2.3 seconds, you turn uh, turn over four tires in the remove four tires, put in four tires. You can act, actually have the nose changed of a Formula One car, and there's this huge group of around 15 to 20 people hovering around the car, each playing their own single role. And to me, that is the essence of what healthcare should be all about. And if we are able to crack this, the, the fact that we work uh, cohesively with these various stakeholders without stepping on each other uh, other's toes, each of them realizing their own role in it and playing it to perfection, I think uh, the 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 uh, uh, there are there are no boundaries to where we will reach. And this is uh, something that I would very strongly uh, uh, urge. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, so uh, this, uh, so I, I know this uh, cancer treatment is like lot of follow up treatment. People have to come back. Uh, otherwise, there's a chance of re it recurring and everything. So with this virtual era, I mean this, uh, do you think it is going to be easier? I mean, little bit ease this follow up, getting appointments, people will come back. So uh, absolutely, uh, I think uh, thanks to COVID. Uh, so there, there was this huge uh, reluctance amongst patients as well as uh, providers to uh, rely purely on a virtual uh, follow up system. What if I miss something which the patient has? What if there is some finding which because I have not examined the patient, I will miss out. But I think to a large extent it has been laid to rest by the uh, fact that COVID forced this upon us. And uh, now we find patients and uh, providers being far more comfortable with uh, using these device, uh, these tools much more than it uh, ever was. So I think it's here to stay and uh, it, it, it is actually a very good sign as far as uh, healthcare access is concerned because you no longer have the need to travel long distances to be able to access uh, expert care. And this is something that's very, very important. Uh, so can we say that the indirect healthcare cost will go down? Uh due to this? So uh, I think at least with telemedicine, it's very clear that indirect health costs uh, will go down. Uh, what we need some more confidence and clarity upon is the fact that outcomes are not compromised. And uh, I think these are very uh, specific to each situation. So for example, if you had some someone with very advanced metastatic cancer, uh, missing a, some something getting missed on that follow up, probably doesn't mean that much. But if somebody has a potentially life threatening complication happening, which requires acute care, if that gets missed, then I think that's something that we need to be conscious about. So continuing to uh, to to collect data on all of these interventions is very important, as we saw with the Apple Watch example, uh, even if it's been proven in in uh, robust studies. Thank you. I have one more question. I have I have read that in tuberculosis there is a discrimination in men and women healthcare. Like uh, it's like a stigma for women, especially unmarried women. So in Indian cancer healthcare, is there any kind of such discrimination? Do you think? So uh, in some situations, yes. Uh, so when we looked at our own uh, pediatric cancer data, we found that more uh, boys were getting treated as compared to girls. And this is uh, contrary to most of the data available uh, in other uh, societies globally, where uh, girls uh, where, where girls are actually a higher number to get treated than uh, the boys primarily because there are uh, some cancers which are more common in them and uh, to some extent it does uh, uh, happen but again uh, there's some there's been some very uh, 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 real world solutions that we found to this by creating an environment in pediatric uh, care which ensures that patients don't lose their livelihood, parents don't lose their livelihood, children don't, uh, uh, the cost of uh, cancer care for children doesn't uh, bankrupt the parent. And this is thanks to some of the NGOs that we work with. Uh, for example, St. Jude's is a classic example, who provide uh, uh, accommodation services, education for students, uh, education for the children, uh, job opportunities for the parents and so on, thereby creating a holistic solution wherein uh, treatment abandonment is reduced. And we've been able to flip this, uh, uh, the ratio of uh, girls to boys being treated to uh, almost reach a neutral level. Thank you. Yeah. Not digital health, but a very effective solution. 
Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, any more questions? No, I don't have a question. I just wanted to comment that uh, wonderful session. Nice to meet you, Dr. Pramesh, online and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Prasad. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasad. So I can see a raised hand uh, from Aniruddha, Mr. Aniruddha. Hey, hey, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm not able to find the chat button, so I will ask it on. Yeah, uh, maybe you can increase your volume. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, good morning, sir. Nice talk. I just wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, there are few cancers which are very prevalent in some parts of the country, and very few centers uh, treat uh, those type of cancer. And in other parts of country, it might not be so. So you won't even get a single case of that cancer. So how does uh, one envision uh, the expertise of reporting those cancers or treating and diagnosis uh, those type of cancers? in some part of country and uh, how does AI play a role in that and uh, the role of NCC in that? Thank you. Uh, that's that's a really good question and that goes to the uh, heart of what we describe as a hub and spoke or a distributed model of cancer care. So what we are promoting uh, is the fact that most of the common cancers and the less complicated cancers should be treated close to home. So this uh, uh, involves probably about 80% of all cancers. So uh, a, pa a patient with a very common cancer or a cancer which has a fairly straightforward treatment solution offered to uh, the patient should have care without having to travel long distances. On the other hand, there are some of these rarer cancers and more complicated cancers where we advocate a more um, centralized approach. The exact opposite of what I described earlier, which was a decentralized approach which looks at uh, creating these centers of excellence for rare cancers and complicated treatments. And we encourage that patients, which, which will then only form 20% of all of uh, India's cancers, going to these centers of excellence, which means that the expertise, the infrastructure, the equipment that is needed to treat these cancers are localized in a particular uh, central area. And it, it uh, uh, negates the need for creating multiple such centers in all parts of the country. So I'll take this example of proton therapy, which is a, an exciting new um, method of radiation therapy gives highly precise with very high doses of radiation and this is most useful for children with brain tumors so you must understand and the cost of this equipment of one equipment is close to 400 crores of indian rupees so it is clearly not possible to have hundreds of these uh, proton therapy machines across the country so what we advocate here is a more central uh, form of treatment where all children with pediatric tumors, which is actually a pretty rare disease as far as cancers go, are referred to these centers of excellence and thereby you, you use these op uh, resources more optimally. Sir, but uh, then uh, we just discussed that AI would uh, make it a common playing ground for uh, uh, diagnosing these type of cancer. So it would be easier to diagnose these types of cancer. So would right. that not lead to a decentralized approach in treating these rare type of cancers? So, so uh, uh, sitting in Bombay, if I'm seeing that cancer, I would be equally uh, competent enough as one in Chennai or uh, in Guwahati for that matter. In a, in a number of situations, yes, where it doesn't depend upon the uh, actual expertise. It's a, if it's a skill-based uh, situation. So for example, for complex uh, uh, surgery, for example, uh, we have still not reached the phase where uh, you have virtual surgery being performed uh, across yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the, 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 across large distances. But whereas when it comes to diagnostics, this is certainly something that can happen. Using AI, using diagnostic tools with AI, with pathology, you can certainly uh, make this uh, available locally. But again, coming back to this situation of infrastructure. So if you needed a patient to be treated with proton therapy, this is not something that you could do in 100 centers across. So it would be a nuanced answer to that for certain diagnostics uh, uh, situations where the treatment can be offered close, but the di diagnostic tools are not available everywhere. We certainly could leverage AI. Having said that, I am aware of some um, uh, newer uh, advances, even with uh, remote surgery. So it's not too far-fetched, but it's not uh, ready for time, prime time uh, just yet. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Pramesh, uh, for the talk. Uh, now okay. I would like to invite uh, Professor Ganesh Ramakrishnan, our PIC, to give the vote of thanks.
thanks again dr pramesh uh, thanks professor sudeep gupta mr girish raghavan dr pramesh for very enlightening talks i think this was a very enriching session overall uh, and it's it's also interesting that we've kind of completed this in record time uh, we've completed before time this also speaks volumes of how valuable the time of our doctors are so they um, uh, we should all learn to value that time uh, i'd also like to invite the audience to a uh, couple of sessions we're going to have later in the day in fact right now we're going to have some student posters i'm just going to uh, bring up this uh, slide so we'll have poster competition by students until 12 10 pm um followed by industry talks at 12 10 we'll have mr nipun virmani co-founder rrai and then these are shorter talks um and then the industry talk to by mr shashank chilam kurti uh, founding member of cure.ai um, we we'll again like we had the morning keynote talks uh, we'll have evening keynote talks at 7 and 8 respectively by professor bhramar mukherji uh, at 7 and then by dr nitish thakur at 8 um between 5 and 7:20 pm we'll have spotlights on research projects uh, funded by kcdh so, so several of them are collaboration with tata memorial hospital and uh, several other reputed hospitals the 14 projects 10 minutes each so with that note i would like to uh, thank again the speakers uh, i look forward to continued interaction of this sort thanks dr pramesh thanks dr sudeep and thanks girish Thank you, Ganesh. So now we need to join our new link, or just continue on. No, no, screen? link will be same. Link will remain same. Okay, okay, okay. So I think uh, our poster uh, presenters are also with us. Am I right, Abu? One is Abu, and another Abhilash. is Abhilash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, If that should be followed by Dr. Nirmal is also ready then we can start right now yeah so oh, we can start yeah dr nirmal you are there am i audible yeah yeah you are audible and our presenters are also also with us so we can start that session poster session poster competition session right now okay. is that okay participants abu and abhilash I think that'll be great. We can get started right now. We'll have a little more time for interaction. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I request to uh, Dr. Nirmal to proceed this session. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Nirmal. Uh, Dr. Rashmi, like, or is there a sequence? Like, Abhilash is going first, or Abu? Abu, Abu is going to first, followed by Abhilash. Okay. So is Abu here? I think he has not joined it, but his name is. Yeah, he is there. Abu, can you respond, please? His hello. Name is in the list. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, yes. You are audible. Hello. You are audible, Abu. Hello. You are very much audible. Hello, ma'am. Uh, how could I present uh, my chart in front of you? Dr. Nirmal, hello. Could you like Abu? You can see the share screen option on your uh, Teams. Yes. Yeah, so yes. 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 Rashmi, just make them into a presenter, right? You can make them as presenters. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. 
So. Abu, are you able to share your screen? Ye yes, so I am able to. I'm sorry for being late, but I'm trying to connect. Share yeah, that's screen. fine. Is my screen is visible to you? Oh, uh, not yet. हेलो मैं डज माई स्क्रीन इज शेयरिंग विद यू हेलो Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, Abu. Hello. Uh, we can see. Hello. Yes. Uh, we can see, but uh, it's a bit smaller. So can you just go to some full screen mode? Are you sharing from your mobile phone? Yes, I am sharing from my mobile phone. Okay. You might have to zoom it a bit. Uh, yes. For the test, as of now, it's not readable for everyone. the my topic is of the portable way of genome sequencing as by this method the genome the genome library could be made of the particular organism by this we could understand about the evolutionary relationship of the organism as well as identify the genetic defect and the abnormalities in the individual too in the first of say david demer he was the person who has developed the concept of nanopore and my topic is mainly focused on the nanopore sequencing which was developed in early 1990s and it was from harvard university now in the diagram we could see that the dna is being uh, uh, the helical structure is being separated and the one sequence of the dna is been passed through the protein pore and from that protein the nucleotide moves through it the new the electrical signal is been generated and that electrical signal is been recorded and been able to analyze what the sequence is as we could see here the uh, potential is been met and the change in the potential is been always measured here are the few steps in which the how the uh, genome from any of the uh, organism uh, means either of the plant uh, a bacteria or of the virus or of human being any of the genome uh, any of the living organism genome could be isolated and after that it could be treated and by the use of the software software the change in the electrical signal or the uh, change in the electrical potential through the nanopore is been detected and that detection ultimately help in making the whole sequence library of the genome and ultimately we will get the whole genomic library as the consequence of this process now at here we could see the 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 structure in which there are there were two port primary port and the sample port in the primary port the buffer is been filled but the caution is been maintained so that, that the bubble would not get introduced in it and on the sample porting site the sample is been poured and after that the things would get ready 
uh, our nanopore sequence would get ready to utilize and it could it is a small device of palm size and it could easily get connected to the computer and by the use of the software mink no we could easily uh, sequence the, that data uh, and would easily be able to analyze what type of organism are we dealing with so he could here we could see the different living organisms rabbit human plant and the uh, organelles is been separated and the dna is been obtained and after that the library you could see here the port type of device which is the, which after that this port type of device um, is connected to the laptop and this through the sequence we could easily get analyze of all of the data what are the functional and the uh, trans uh, what are the translation processes going on the rest of the type of the process of the living organ we could easily get analyzed so here we could see a snake or an um, wild animal we would just uh, we would just poke its body and make slight fluid out of it so that we could get some certain cells and there is no extra uh, work which we need to do in the nanopore sequencing so here just by the use of the nanopore kit and this process is very simple and very compatible and portable uh, by this method we could easily get sequence uh, of any of the thing like microorganisms plant bacteria genome we could identify the uh, genetic characteristics or the genetic defect of the individual or we could uh, think about the drugs design of for the specific type of the cancer which the person is mainly facing because uh, the cancer is mainly different in different type of people so according to the type of the defect we could treat those defect too and here we could see the clinical scientists and the plant research we could easily get analyzed and what are the primary metabolite and the secondary metabolite does this plant could produce in the biodiverse area such as the tropical rainforest type of area we could easily get analyzed that what type of uh, product does we could obtain from the plants and that would ultimately help in the curing of the uh, disease by opening a medicine from it by either through the primary or the secondary process passing through it uh, then the population and the uh, detection of the uh, mission and trans transcription translation and replication all of things could get uh, analyzed could we could easily get an uh, understand those things and compare it with the abnormal one and here are few of the references from which i had prepared my material through that and there are some advantage and disadvantage uh, the price uh, of handling the nanopore sequencing is much more affordable and it is of portable help in identifying defects in sequence of genome and there are also disadvantage that it requires significant core size uh, on engineered it required and well engineered material so that uh, the specific size nanopore is been created and after that by applying of the uh, potential the um, the um, single stranded dna could or rna could get passed through it and the change in the uh, fluctuation of the um, current is been observed and then it is been used to detect the type of the sequencing no demonstration of the single base resolution of internal base pairing base portions so here we could see the sequence the graph is been formed over here and this is the all which i have this is the diagram of the way by which we could insert the buffer and the sample in the device and these are my few references i had taken the reference from the direct science real time nanopore oxford and nanopore oxford technology and cell process thank you uh, thank you abu for your presentation so the if anybody has any questions uh, they can ask now uh, so meanwhile others ask question abu i have some question from what you have presented so yes, when sir. you 
when you're talking about this nano pore sequencing so what like you said uh, you took uh, an animal and you are taking samples directly from the animal so is there some pre processing that is involved like can you take what type of samples can you take and what cannot uh, we could take any type of samples either of rna or of dna and through the nano pore sequencing the the change in the fluctuation of the uh, voltage is being detected across the nano pore and that is ultimately been used in sequencing the genome of that particular organism this i am getting your uh, is there some pre there will be some pre processing involved like what is the exact sample you are taking yes. are you doing some pre processing over there is by the use of the oxford nano pore kit we would just take the body fluids or the sample specimen from the living organism and after doing a very short treatment with those things we could easily get used uh, that sample along with the um you are not audible abu abu can you hear me yes yes i could hear you uh, can you repeat uh, you are not audible in between so we could take sample or a specimen from any of the living organism and by taking the specimen either from the in the form of the body fluid either in the form of the blood or in the form of the serum we do uh, a small treatment with the uh, a small procedure with the nano pore kit which is available with the nano pore machine and after treating our specimen with it we would directly introduce the sample along with the nano pore buffer into the uh, sample into the nano pore sequencing machine and after that we would connect that machine our nano pore sequencer into our laptop and we could observe our result by the help of the minio software which is especially in been made for nano pores also as this experiment is also been performed in the space also on the bacteriophage e coli and on the mouse cells genome and the comparison is been observed between the space uh, sequencer of these things these organism and the sequence which is been done on the land the sequence has mainly been matched the so there was a great similarity between the sequencing which has been done through the nanopore in the space in the international space center and on the land under the normal atmospheric condition so it is much more reliable way of sequencing okay, okay. and when you say like you saw a very good similarity so what are the you can say like accuracy or what are the error rates that you have observed over here in inter so mis mismatching that you have seen uh i i think it uh, the error rate would be around only 2% 98% the there would be the accuracy of this sequencing okay uh, as per the uh, as per the abstract which i had studied in the oxford nanopore uh, dot seek dot tech in that okay. websites from okay. that i had taken lots of references in preparing this e chart okay fine hello uh, okay anybody in the audience they have any questions for abu you can either type in chat or you can unmute yourself and ask I think the main yeah, advantage yes, of this nano pore sequencing is that we could do the sequencing in any part of the world in any of the condition especially in the interior area of the africa where the ebola sequencing or the omicron sequencing could easily be take place and the world could uh, also do effective measurements uh, to prevent from disease especially in the remote area where there laboratory facility are specially lacking okay 
I just want to ask one more thing about this from the sampling part. So at a time you can do one sample at a time or if you get there are multiple ports over there. Yes, we could do a multiple. Uh, uh, multi. Uh, no, no, no. At a time we need to deal with one sample, but there are multiple ports, 156 nano ports in the nano sequencer machine. But at one time we need to deal with single organisms. Okay, fine. Uh, so if there are no more questions, I will uh, will thank the presenter Abu and they will have the next presentation from Abhilash. Thank you, sir. Goodbye, sir. And bye. Thank you. Abhilash, can you share your screen? Yes, yes. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting this poster uh, titled as uh, De Novo Lipogenic Pathway as a Putative Therapeutic Target in CRC, that is Colorectal Cancer. So my topic is quite uh, kind of different from, from uh, the scope, actually, uh, or, or the area we are talking here. But this, uh, the work we have done has some digital influence in the screening of this, of this disease for that, that is the colorectal cancer. So uh, I'm working as a SRF in proteomics lab, uh, IIT Bombay, where we have, where we focus on biomarker discovery and functional characterization of the biomarkers. And we try to explore role of those particular uh, proteins or genes in, in development or prognosis of the cancer. So I am working on colorectal cancer, uh, tissue samples basically. So we, we take surgically resected tissues. We have collaborated with uh, KEM hospital from where we get the tissue directly from patients. Also, we take the peritumoral kind of the non-tumorous part of the organ and we consider them as our control. So in this panel, I have shown a kind of uh, a patient of an 10, 10, 10 patient sample with the control from kind of matched control. So I've also taken control from the same patient where the cancer is not there. And we try to check, we, we have some hypothesis previously from our previous finding that the de novo lipogenic process, including the enzyme FAS and SCLY are quite predominant in the, that cancer progression. So that was our hypothesis. And we try to perform some targeted proteomics based validation of those proteins. And we got that if you see this N1, if I can zoom this a little bit more, you can see clearly that this is for the FAS. So all the N1s are the controls and T1s are the tumors. And in C, the same patient have different expression level of the enzymes, FASN, in the samples. So in tumor, it is quite threefold or fourfold more as compared to the control samples or the normal sample. And similarly, the other protein, the CLY, that is also showing a very huge level of expression. So by taking the peak area intensity, we did a basic machine learning approach to check whether the expression level of these proteins or enzymes are able to differentiate the controls from the treatment or from, from the tumor group. So if they are able to segregate by just doing a basic test of uh, by checking the expression of this protein, can we say that whether the tissue is cancerous or normal? So by doing so, we did a normal SPM uh, uh, based machine learning uh, kind of approach where we got kind of accuracy of 0 0.08 which is considered very good and out of 20 sample 17 samples were showing very uh, good kind of uh, uh, giving a very good result so from where we got that the proteins are actually able to distinguish cancers from the controls and then we take if they are over overexpressed what is the role of this protein to know that we we developed a cell culture based model. We got the cell cells from NCC Pune 
and then we try to look at the level of this protein and then we identified one inhibitor compound that inhibits that blocks these proteins and we, we inhibited the samples the cells and we got that by inhibiting the proteins we are actually able to see there is a clear cell death so by taking the drug by taking the inhibitor can we do this kind of test to control or manage the cancer in a better way again we did some basic uh, cell molecular and cellular approaches to study where they are impacting and we got that it is it is controlling the cell cycle checkpoint between the g1s checkpoint and by doing so it is also uh, inducing apoptosis apoptosis is a process of programmed cell death so if we means this this pathway is in turn from here we got that this pathway is in turn a kind of tumorigenic and if we can check the protein we can detect the cancer and if you can target the protein with, with some inhibitor or some drugs the, the the cancer can be managed better and then we did a basic molecular and cellular proteomics approach to know where they are kind of uh, what is the role of these proteins and we got that by inhibiting the protein we are blocking the PI3K AKTM tor pathway. Along with that, it is also inducing a double strand DNA, a kind of double strand break that is inducing a uh, cell cycle arrays followed by the protease machinery that is inducing the cell death. So from here, actually, whatever we can compile on this from this brief study, we can say that the D novel liposynthesis is a kind of uh, tumorigenic process that is inducing the cancer and I mean that is at least playing a very vital role in the cancer progression. If we can detect, if we can detect the level or measure the level of the protein, we can say whether the sample, at least we can predict whether the samples are cancerous or not. And if we can identify some compound that blocks this process, it can further, we can further move to the clinical trials to deactivate the role of or role of the pathway in, in the cancer samples. And if we inactivate the protein or inactivate the pathway, it is showing a hyperactivation in the protease or machinery followed by apoptosis induction that is, that is somehow controlling the cell proliferation and metastasis. So this is my brief work and uh, I saw. If anybody have any question, they can ask me. Thank you, Abhilash, for the quick summary of your work. So we have a couple of minutes for the questions. If anybody have, they can unmute themselves and ask. So, so meanwhile, others ask, uh, Abhilash, can you just show the poster again on the screen? Yes. Yes. Is it visible? Yes. Uh, so can you just explain the second curve, like where you're comparing FAS, FASN and ACLY, like uh, with the relative intensity which is plotted? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, the controls are non-cancerous cells, non-tumorous tissue, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And CAC is the cancer cells. So uh, yeah, you, you got it right. Actually, uh, yesterday I made this presentation. So uh, the CAC, the, so CAC actually I have wrongly marked this. So this should yeah. be where the control, I should mark this as control and this is the CAC because if you see the peak intensity from the result and if you put any violin or box plot or bar plot, the CAC level is always kind of upregulated. I mean, the, the protein level in CAC is upregulated as compared to control. Yes, so I mistaken we I marked this as a CAC. Yeah, because that was my confusion. It was appearing uh -huh. like so. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, I got this now. <laughs> And in terms of like uh, when you said on this right and part, uh, right side part where you're saying you took the cell, you cultured the cell and then you added inhibitors and you saw yes. that they were breaking down. What yes. was the response with control ones? Because even in controls, there are some relative intensity that you are seeing in terms like, especially if you look at the ACLY, yes. in the control you are having a, you can say a big, uh, the plot, there's a significant overlap between control and your CAC. Yes. So in, in that terms, like what did you saw when you added inhibitors for ACLY in the control cells? What was the observations? So if you see these cells, if you can see my cursor, 
the okay. first one was actually the control cells and uh, the second one is the treatment so here actually we have not selected the inhibitor for fas and acl but we got we did actually on talking study and we identified some uh, inhibitor one, one inhibitor that is binding predominantly to fas and in uh, in, in uh, the pathway fas is the terminal one so we try to inhibit the terminal pathway the fas and by doing so if you can see these cells this is the same experiment this is the control cells this is how actually the morphology looks if i take one normal uh, colon cancer cell line this is how they look and this is the treatment cells so if you can see here they have attained their normal morphology they are kind of different in the shape but here after treatment they are floating they, they are detached from the surface they have changed their morphology and after sometimes they they will float around the in in the flask and they will die eventually so this is how they look after the treatment so in that this is uh, moving towards cell death maybe necrosis or apoptosis okay okay and also like do you think like in terms of a uh, point of care diagnostic device suppose like like whatever observation you have seen in the in terms of the levels of fasn and acly that you are observing uh, so it can like uh, like right now you are using a sophisticated instrument for measuring but in case if we come up with a, a point of care device so is there a way that by maybe by taking the ratios of fasn to acly or something like that we can differentiate between the crc cells and the controls yes yes we can but then the instrument will be the same but then the method we have to determine a very small method so here we have developed the method one method called parallel reaction monitoring so in that method you can uh, identify any protein that that you want to fit to the instrument so we just have to give protein uh, proteomically whatever protein we can extract from the samples we have to provide them and the the instrument will measure the level of that particular protein so this takes actually uh, this analysis and analysis takes a uh, first protein extraction including that it takes 24 hours so if we can extract the protein if we can neglect that part the remaining method takes around uh, 2 hours so that we have optimized now for 10 minutes method so if we can extract the proteins if we have the sample we can do this uh, test within a within 10 minutes so this is now we are moving towards a very precision kind of test so if we can validate this in a very uh, kind of at least some more samples we will be more confident on this i think that's it from my end if anybody else has any question we have 30 seconds or a minute if somebody wants to ask abilas something Uh, if not, then I would like to uh, thank both these uh, presenters, Abu and Abhilash, for their presentations. Thanks. And I request KCDH office to take these for the next part of the session. OK, thank you, Dr. Nirmal. Thank you for chairing this session. Now I would like to request to Professor Amit, who has joined, rejoined with us. And uh, uh, our next speaker is also with us. So, Professor Amit, please share this session. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so, who's going first? Is it uh, Nipun or uh, Shashank? Yeah, yeah. Nipun. Nipun. Mr. Nipun is going to first. All right. Great. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Nipun Virmani here. Uh, so, I have known Nipun for uh, close to a decade now. We have uh, a uh, common friend uh, who's uh, very close to both of us. And uh, Nepal, he came back to India. He's been a serial entrepreneur. He's been a co he's a co-founder right now of RIA Insurance. Uh, he's a avid technologist who spends a, who spent a number of years building trading systems for Goldman Sachs in the US uh, before turning towards tech and product entrepreneurship in India. He got a got an MBA degree from MIT uh, and has a computer engineering degree from University of Michigan. And outside of work, uh, he's been an advisor to Seva Bharat and currently serves as a co-president of MIT Club of Delhi. So over to you, Nipun. 
Right. Hi, Amit. Thanks, everyone. And, uh, you know, thanks to KCDH and IIT Bombay for having me here today. Uh, I hope everyone can see and hear me well. Uh, let yes. me just go into sharing mode. I'll just bring up my presentation. Yeah, we can see your screen, yes. All right. So, and thanks to everyone for taking the time out to join me here today as well. Uh, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about uh, what I know about digital health. Uh, I saw some pretty uh, high tech stuff when I was here for the last few minutes, but uh, this is a different kind of uh, tech and digital health that I'll be talking about. Um, as Amit said, I'm one of the co-founders of RIA. Uh, we're an insure tech company focused on driving better health outcomes for people with uh, health insurance. And today I'm talking a little bit about India's digital health stack and how we're using it to improve health insurance and health outcomes. So I understand that uh, most students here are already familiar with Ayushman Bharat's digital health mission uh, thanks to the close ties between KCDH, IIT Bombay and ABDM. Um, but I'll just spend maybe a quick minute telling folks who don't know much, just a, giving a quick introduction. So ABDM is obviously defining some of the core building blocks for digital health in India. And uh, we are, as part of the industry and startup ecosystem, we're very excited because this has, a, has the potential to transform healthcare, much like UPI did for payments uh, in India. So while you see many different building blocks here, you know they're sort of divided into three major layers, which are the user applications, the health interface layer and the data exchange layer. And there are many different components, which all of which are really important and uh, add significant value to the ecosystem. But what I'm going to do is talk about one piece here and how it's uh, uh, how we are leveraging that, uh, which is the health information exchange. And one important part of the health information exchange is actually health data standardization. So why is uh, health data standardization important? You know, so we, if we look at the human body today, right, you know, there's no doubt that it's very complex. You know, there are thousands and thousands of conditions we suffer, can suffer from. Uh, there are thousands of procedures that can be done on us. There are tens of thousands of different uh, medications out there that we can take and many more. Right? And from a terminology perspective, if we look at an example of the coronavirus, right, it's been referred to in so many different ways. There's Corona, COVID, COVID-19, SARS, COVID. Then we have the variants which continue to grow. Uh, if we look at diabetes, and this is a search from a medical catalog called ICD, and I'll tell you a little bit about ICD shortly. But we see diabetes itself has so many different nuances and variations of two, uh, which are very specific, right? As you can see on the screen. Uh, if we you know, our health records, which last many, many years uh, in in time, we we want to make sure that, you know, something diagnosed early on is easily understood, recognized later on in life by a different doctor, right? That same doctor may or may not be around. We might be in a different country, city. We don't want any kind of confusion in what our health record states, uh, especially when we, uh, you know, move to another doctor, provider, etc., right? Uh, that's one thing I don't think I want anyone to get confused about. So um, that's why these systems for classifying, identifying and communicating health data emerged uh, in order to make sure that data is consistent, standardized and understanding is also consistent. But of course, you know, health data standardization is a very complex problem, right? Uh, if I look at just a few examples I put up on screen here, health data exists in various shapes, forms, and sizes, right? So here on screen on the left, you may see uh, handwritten notes or prescriptions. You may see a printed uh, uh, format of a uh, report. In the middle, you see different languages used, uh, sometimes on the same form. You know, you see uh, a dolo written in English, but there's some thing written below in uh, Hindi. Uh, and then 
of course, you know, we have scans and images and X-rays of varying uh, degrees. And, and, you know, I know Amit has done significant work in pathology. I've not even put that up here, right? So we know that it's, it's extremely diverse and complex. Um, and how do we standardize this? So one part of how to standardize this uh, brings us to medical coding. Today, if we look at medical coding globally, there are three major standards of medical coding out there. Uh, the first is called ICD, which is the International Classification of Diseases. The second one is called LOINC, which is used for lab observations primarily. And the third is SNOMED, which is used for clinical terms and symptoms, but is one of the most extensive of the three uh, medical coding systems out there. Uh, all of these in some combination or the other uh, are used across the world. Uh, some countries are still evolving them. So if we look at ABDM and India's health stack, uh, it has proposed the use of all three of these standards, as you see on the right hand side. Uh, but also there are a few others mentioned here in terms of DICOM for diagnostic images and scans. And all, more importantly, one called FHIR, which is used for interoperability of health data. So any information of exchange of health data between systems, say a, a hospital and an insurer, uh, your device, uh, you know, your Fitbit, your Apple Watch, your Goki, uh, and uh, a, a certain other system. If it's not doing so today, it will be likely following uh, these standards, including FHIR for interoperability fairly soon. Companies like Apple and Google Health as well, uh, in terms of their health uh, part of the ecosystem, do follow uh, some of these data standards. So how do we look to standardize this data if it's so complex? So one of the things we do is we take health data, which varies in all kinds of forms, uh, shapes, volume, and velocity, and we bring it into a data lake in its raw form. Now, that includes things like medical scans, images, reports, activity feeds, so on and so forth, right? Now, when we have that raw data, then we start to run other tech on top of it to uh, first digitize it. And again, I know this has a problem, uh, some of you especially Professor Amit and others in the ecosystem have worked on previously using uh, image processing techniques and algorithms to extract data from images, convert it into text. But for us, the additional layer comes in in trying to codify it using these medical data standards. And then, of course, apply medical rules and validation to make sure that the coding that we have obtained from these algorithms actually makes sense. Uh, and that's an important step. And as it continues to evolve and more and more data is available to us, uh, AI uh, also starts to come into the picture to help solve this problem. Now, once we've standardized some of this data, right, what I just described to you was that we took some data from various sources, like labs, customer history, hospitals, so on. We applied some medical coding standards we brought it into a standard form in our health data platform. Uh, there was additional customer data we have around customers. And then we, using that standard health record, we pass it into a core insurance and health underwrite health platform, which we use for various use cases, like underwriting, distribution, claims, and improving health. So let me take one use case and tell you a little bit more about what health insurance underwriting is and how do we use that standard health record there. So for those of you not familiar with health insurance underwriting, it's basically the process by which uh, usually a medically trained person or often a medical doctor will take your health insurance application with all the all your health records that you might have submitted to them. They look at it, they evaluate it, they're trying to gauge your health risk, and based on that, decide whether or not they want to give you an insurance policy or what kind of pricing you should get. Now, this is a 
complex procedure it takes time sometimes human underwriters are sitting and processing hundreds of applications manually every day in some cases it may take 7 days to get a decision back on your on your uh, application right so once we standardize the health data and we understand what's what are some of the conditions in your past so if we look at this on screen you see a uh, kind of a rule set here it says if you've had this condition represented by this code in the past and there is some status duration uh, that we know that you had it for or had it in the past this rule set will make a decision to say yes let's accept this risk or let's you know uh, we need to conduct further tests or it needs to be rejected for certain reason or the other so rather than uh, having human underwriters look at all this data manually we're able to start to simplify make the process quicker and faster uh, through these kind of rules for now uh, and there are about 4 lakh medical rules that we've created around this so you can imagine the complexity when you may have multiple conditions and so on and so forth but and then gradually as we get more and more data we build more intelligence uh, and on top of that uh, so this is one example of how standardized health records can help us uh, improve health insurance another example is in health claims so i one of the biggest complaints that people have about health insurance is that when you go into a hospital when you're in a time of need uh, that's when some of these insurers don't come to your uh, help right they they take hours and hours they make you sit there do paperwork then they might say no this is rejected for xyz reason or they may not even give you a reason and then that's really not a time when you want to sit and wait and uh have to deal with all of this so in a similar manner to what i described when claims data which is a lot of it is health data comes into the system you can digitize it you can start to classify it code it up using the uh, health data standards uh, and then pass it through an engine where you can map it with a person's insurance policy so for example in this case i mentioned the person came in with a severe pneumonia and pneumonia has a icd code of j13 we can look up the insurance policy uh, and very quickly make a determination saying hey yes this is uh, okay to approve and go ahead and instantaneously uh, pass the claim and and send uh, details back to the provider right so trying to make this easier and faster for for a customer uh, and improve the process of insurance one final example that i do have is how do we use this uh, standardized health data for improving health outcomes so as more and more data comes in right uh, think about your uh, activity trackers and and you know your medical records from labs and statements as more and more data comes in uh, you know there are these clinical pathways and algorithms and uh, you know all kinds of intelligence that researchers and organizations and startups around the world are building on top of uh, some health data which they are using to predict or to try to drive interventions in advance on people right so having this standardized health data which is fairly universal because it's using the same coding standards allows uh, us and others to use these kind of models use these clinical pathways the one you see here is actually one we have uh, pulled from an international organization and allows us to then drive intervention in healthcare so for example if someone shows an increase in weight blood pressure you can perhaps this pathway may suggest an adjustment in the diet or a change in medication thereby obviously trying to make a customer's a uh, health make a customer healthier and so uh, you know to summarize of course uh, i wanted to just introduce everyone to a small part of what uh, ayushman bharat digital missions data standardization uh, recommendations are and why they are important and how we are trying to use it uh, as a startup in this space to drive improvements in health insurance and uh, and health outcomes for people as well uh, There's plenty of more. This is just scratching the surface. 
but would love to answer any questions if anyone might have. Thanks again to IIT Bombay and KCDH for having me. Thanks a lot, Nepon. Uh, any questions from the audience? So I have a question. So Nepon, this uh, entire data standardization, format standardization exercise, that's uh, quite a huge and has many stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the most or which are some of the most challenging stakeholders and how do you think uh, they can also be brought in under uh, they can also uh, learn about uh, the benefits of data standardization and how do we drive that change you know one of the most challenging ones that uh, we see today is actually the the ehr and emr space uh, because india in terms of uh, health record systems even in hospitals and i'm only considering say the easier ones of the lot right the hospitals which do have some kind of systems out there uh, the the space is very fragmented there are hundreds of different systems being used and so there's barely any standardization uh, investing in some of the tech to start to standardize is also expensive for them right so uh, where there is motivation to use a system even there it's it's often expensive and we'll have to see how you know the government even though it's recommending all of this it it is going to be a little bit of a gradual evolution to get there. Now, obviously, beyond that, um, I know that uh, uh, Ayushman Bharat, through uh, its own uh, health program and mission, uh, is trying to uh, take some of the data at the grassroots level that it does have and try to act on it. Uh, I don't know too much about the quality of data. I have heard various things from people, so that I, I won't get into that side of things, but focusing on the, uh, you know, the part where there is some kind of digitization initiatives already happening, that I think is one of the more complex. And uh, are there like any uh, compelling uh, economic advantages to for dis digitalization, uh, digitization to let's say small pharmacies or small clinics, uh, if not in the short term, in the medium term, that can be used to uh, convince them? That's a great uh, question. Um, you know, I think uh, would have to think about that a bit more. But I mean, I think the 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 since you brought about pharmacies, one of the things that the government is trying to also do is to create a standardized drug registry uh, as part of this digital digitization. Um, and so, by having say a standardized drug registry where you know you can start to easily uh, look at prescriptions and uh, and figure out what health, uh, what what drugs need to be given uh, without confusion. I think that that part could lead to less errors. However, at the same time, we do know we're in an ecosystem where uh, there's a lot of things happening off the books, and you know there's a lot of uh, fraud, waste, and abuse in the system. Now, some of that, uh, I'm afraid, unfortunately, does end up uh, helping the small pharmacies and, and so on. So it's an interesting question and we'll have to see how we can drive better economics and we don't have a good answer to that. Yet. Thanks, uh, Professor Ganesh, you go ahead with your question. Thanks. Yeah, your, your answer. Thanks for a nice talk, uh, uh, Mr. Nippon. Your uh, answer actually led me to the next question. So given you know, SNOMED and other kinds of uh, standard uh, efforts towards standardization, what is the scope for building in Indian languages? Um, I mean, should it be translation? Should it be transliteration? Or have there been standards that you've been part of there? And what is your experience overall dealing with multilinguality? Uh, sorry, can I 